Okay, let's get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Arthur Samuelson. I'm the program director at the Rowe Conference Center, and we're thrilled and delighted to host this program with Sharon Blackie um, this, after, this day, afternoon for us. We're located in Western Massachusetts in a very beautiful corner of the state, surrounded by trees and river and a lake. And um, we've been here almost 100 years. Uh, running summer camps for kids, and since 1974, I've been running weekend workshops on spirituality, personal growth, all the creative arts, nature, um, communication, social change, all things that we think go into making for a flourishing life, and that's what our goal is, is to help people at all stages of life to be able to have a flourishing life. So thank you for joining us online. Of course, for the last couple of years, we've had to do almost everything online after having never done that before and discovering that we can now reach people all over the world. As we can see here, there are people from all over the world here. Um, and we are slowly reopening for on-site programs. Um, we have some very cool things coming up, which you'll now be receiving news of um, through our our emails, um, and I hope that you will join us either online or on site for any of our future programs. Um, uh, I want to introduce my colleague, Fia Alexander. Uh, Fia is speaking to us from Maine, um, and Fia is going to be here to help out Sharon in managing the breakout rooms and triaging questions, and uh, she's available if any of you are having any problems, just direct message her. Um, so thank you, Fia. Fia has been online with us now for almost two years, and how many programs have you helped us with? It's more than two years and hundreds. Hundreds. Well, probably are getting up to around 300. It's like the McDonald's sign. I remember when I was growing up, they used to give a number and then all of a sudden it was billions and billions. So hundreds no, and hundreds. No, no, don't make me do billions. <laughs> no. So I am so delighted to, to um, introduce Sharon. Um, Sharon's an award-winning writer and a psychologist and mythologist who's focused on the development of the mythic imagination and on the relevance of myth, fairy tales, and folk traditions. Um, to the personal, social, and environmental problems we fast, fa face today. She's written five books of fiction and non-fiction, including the best-selling If Women Rose Rooted. Um, and um, her books have been translated, and she's been interviewed all over the place. And her new book is already out, Hagitude, uh, is already out in the UK, and on October 11th is going to uh, be available in the United States. Yay! Um, Sharon, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us for this. Thank you, Arthur. It's lovely to be back um, on the row screen again for a second, second or third online program. I can't remember now, as well as having done an in-person retreat with you a little while ago. Gosh, it probably would be about four years now, I'm guessing. I can't quite remember, but what seems like a millennium ago, anything that is pre-pandemic um, seems a bit like that to me at the moment. So thank you so much, um, everybody, for being here. Now, um, we have got four and a bit hours, four and a half hours this afternoon. Um, and you'll be very relieved to hear I am not going to talk for four and a half hours. That would be exhausting for all of us. So the basic plan is we'll split it into two sessions. We'll have a break halfway through at what is uh, 5.30 my time, which is 12.30 Eastern time, I believe. Uh, we'll take a 30 minute break then. So we'll have two sessions of two hours in effect. And at the end of each of those sessions, we will have a breakout discussion period where you can enjoy each other's wisdom and thoughts about what we've been talking about. There will also be the opportunity during each of the sessions for discussion. So I'll tell you when that is open and invite you to raise your hands on the Zoom screen, that little yellow thing that waves and says you'd like to talk. And we will do that live. Um, I cannot look at the chat and monitor the chat while I am speaking. So any conversation or any comments that you might have on the chat, I'm, I'm uh, afraid I won't be able to monitor. But if there's anything that Fia thinks I need to be aware of, 
I'm sure she will draw my attention to it. So why am I talking about hags? Well, first of all, I want to draw a distinction between the word hag and the word crone. I know that crone is a word that's used very much more in North America than it would be over in this part of the world. But really, it seems to me that they have, when we look at the stories and we look at the characters who are given those labels, they're a little bit different. They're not just different words for the same thing. So certainly in this part of the world and in European myth and folklore, a crone would be a very old woman. Um, she might be frail, not always. She would be very wrinkly and kind of, you know, a, a bit stooped. Uh, so she would be an elder woman really towards the end of her life. So crone is a word here, at least in my part of the world, that has connotations of great age. A hag does not necessarily have that connotation. So a hag is usually used to refer to anybody from kind of midlife onwards. You very rarely hear younger women referred to as hags in the old stories. I mean, you know, we can use anything as an insult these days. But in the old stories, a hag would normally be someone who would be, I would say, around menopause onwards. So the label hag can include a greater population of women. So it doesn't have that connotation of great age, even though it can have. The word hag comes from the Germanic. And it was originally, way back when, used to refer very specifically to supernatural females who were intent on doing harm to humans. So it kind of had the same connotation as the word witch. You know, back in the day, that's what witches were. They were specifically supernatural females who were intent on doing harm. The word witch in its original form was always related to malevolence. And so originally it was the word hag. But over the years, it's come to be a little bit different and to encompass a set of different kind of qualities, which I'm going to explain in a minute. It has, like the word witch, very much been used by, let's just call it the patriarchy for short, to refer to human women who you would like to insult and abuse. Now, we've kind of reclaimed the word witch. I'm not entirely sure we've quite reclaimed the word hag yet, but I intend to have a go at it. Because the qualities of the women who are described as hags or introduced as hags or who we can think of as hags in the old stories, folklore particularly, but also myth, is that they are women who have their own authentic power. They're not defined in relationship to anybody else. They're not somebody's mother, somebody's wife, somebody's grandmother. They might have those family relationships, but that's not what they're about. They are defined by who they are and the qualities that they possess, which are important in a particular story. They tend, almost all of them, and there'll be a couple of examples I'll give where this isn't true, but the vast majority of hags in the old stories are outside the system. They don't live in the middle of the community. They're not part of the hierarchy. They don't go to church. So they have this kind of reputation, if you like, as edge dwellers. And anybody, of course, in the world today who is outside of the system threatens the system. And so hags were portrayed as threatening characters and as malevolent characters in the way that witches were because they didn't fit neatly into the social paradigm or the cultural narrative that tells us how we must behave. So that's why I use the word hag very specifically. And it seems to me that there are many qualities of the hag in myth and folklore that are very positive and that it wouldn't do us any harm at all to reclaim. On the other hand, I don't require everybody to use the word hag. It's not a condition of membership, if you like. I think it's quite fine, but I understand that a lot of people still find it a little bit, well, just not somewhere that they want to go yet. But I just wanted to explain to you why I use that particular word. So that's why I'm talking about hags. Why am I talking about stories? Well, 
Myths and stories. I have always believed, ever since I was a small child and saw the magic of them, then as I was practicing psychology and worked with narrative techniques, and then as I turned to professional mythology, if you like, I've always believed that myths and stories, folklore, fairy tales, and so on, not only help us to understand life as it is, or indeed as it was back in the day, but help us understand how to dream life as we think it ought to be. And there is no question, I think, that we as humans perceive and make sense of the world through stories. Storytelling is a universal human phenomenon. It's something that every culture does. They teach us from a very young age everything that we know. And you know, their lessons are very deep and their lessons are very rich if we learn how to listen to the stories or how to read the stories in uh, the case of the modern world more and more. The stories, the characters in fairy stories and, in, and to some, some extent in myths are always transforming themselves in the face of what look like impossible odds. And I think that inspires us, not because we believe that we can do what they have done literally, but because they teach us that there is always a way out of a seemingly impossible situation. And in that sense, they help us to reimagine ourselves. They refuse to allow us to be passive, to be victims. What they teach us is that usually with the help of other people, including old women, we can overcome what look like impossible odds. So that is one of the many important um, aspects of stories and why I think they are so important, because they help us reimagine ourselves. They capture our imagination. They engage us. We begin to see the possibility of change and transformation. And that's what stories above all are about, transformation. So that's why stories. So the stories that I am interested in are stories from my native traditions. So I tend not to step out of my native traditions. And when I say native, I'm kind of including a fairly wide um, area. I would include most of Western Europe and to an extent Eastern Europe in that. I've always specialised in stories from Britain and Ireland, which are my ancestral lands. Uh, but particularly when I was growing up, I'm sure it was the same for most of you too in North America, European fairy tales played a major role in my childlike imagination. They were read to us, they were filmed, <clears throat> they were everywhere. So we all have been aware of them. So those are the stories that I'm interested in and that I'm going to be focusing on and that I focus on in Hagitude, the book. They, they tell us really that, that older women are important, that older women have power. Although it is true that there are very, very few stories in the European tradition, at least, where older women are the main characters, the protagonists, nevertheless, it's often the case that the older women are the ones who hold the story together, who drive the narrative, who know exactly what it is that the hero or the heroine needs to do to set their own lives back in balance, or sometimes in the big stories to set the world back in balance. So the old women have the big picture and they have the ability to intervene in various ways that we're going to look at to help set the world to rights, to help the hero or the heroine do whatever it is that they need to do in their own personal journey, which always in these stories at some level ultimately benefits the world. So, for example, in the oldest known cosmology of Ireland and Scotland, it wasn't a skybound old man with a beard who made and shaped this world. It was an old woman. And her name was the Cullioch, which literally means old woman in Irish and in Scottish Gaelic. And we'll come back to the Cullioch a little bit later on. And she was a giant old woman who has been with us down all the ages since the very beginning of time. So we hear her say things like, when I was a young lass, the ocean was a forest full of trees. She's seen it all, pretty much floods, everything. And 
interestingly, the stories about her are still very much alive today in the Irish and the Scottish traditions. In Ireland, particularly, every, every place, every county you go to, it seems, has some stories about the Calliach, has some places that are named after the Calliach, whether it be villages or rocky outcrops or mountains and hills. She is kind of everywhere, and pretty much everybody would know who she was, probably to a lesser degree in Scotland, although awareness is, is, um, is rising. But nevertheless, we also find lots of places named after her too, and lots of stories in particular parts of the country. So this is not someone who has been forgotten. It is someone who has been for many, many years relegated to the um to, to the to being a storybook character, whereas once upon a time she would have been a deity, she would have been a goddess, she would have been honored. So in this part of the world, and we do see remnants of Kayak type figures here in Wales and also in England, in this part of the world, where we always talk about Europeans pre-Christianity honoring and worshipping a great mother goddess, we were actually honoring a great grandmother goddess. It was the old women who pulled the strings. And not only here, we're going to meet some old women in, in Greek mythology, for example, who did precisely that as well. So these are important stories. And that's why I want to really focus on them today and why I focus on them in the book, because I believe that these stories, the old women in these stories can inspire us to create a map, if you like, of what it is to be a good elder. They can teach us something about the nature of elder women's wisdom. And what we see in these stories is that there is a great variety of types of wisdom. There is a great variety in the ways in which you can be a good elder. It's not all about being the same character. And that's what I like about them, because we all have our own gifts. We all have our own inclinations, our talents, our skills, our preferred ways of being in the world. And um, it seems to me that there is an old woman for pretty much everybody. And that's really when I did this research project before I embarked upon Hagitude, I did find that quite exciting and not necessarily something that I had expected. So that's what we're going to explore today. And I, I'm, I'm talking about these characters and these stories in the context of the idea that Carl Jung particularly put forward, which is that the second half of life is above all a spiritual journey, an inward turning journey. So Jung argued that during the first half of life, we're kind of building, we're growing, uh, we're creating, you know, a life, a family, if that's what we decide to do. We're a little bit more outward focused in terms of finding our way in the world. Then comes menopause. We're going to talk about menopause in a minute. And that is a pause, not just only in our menses, in our monthly cycles, but really, if it's done, I want to say properly, but that's such an awful judgmental word, but I can't think of a better one. If it's taken seriously, let's say, that is a pause, a psychological pause. And I think of it as a pause between stories, because the story of the second half of life is more inward looking. It's a search for meaning, and it is a search for it is it is a process. It is a journey towards becoming the person that we were always meant to be. So it's a stripping away of all the superfluities. And we grow into the person who most clearly reflects what we might think of as our authentic self. So that's the context in which I want to talk about these stories. We're going to start in the first session with archetypes that relate to menopause. And I hope that for those of you who've been through menopause and brushed that off and done that, you'll still nevertheless find some insight into the process by talking about those. And then in the second half of the session, we're going to talk about um, post-menopausal, elder, more elder women, if you like. So the first thing I want to say is 
and and some of you will know this very well so forgive me uh, I don't know who you all are and what your background is and how much you've worked with these ideas before but I do just want to explain very briefly the concept of archetype because it's a word that I'm going to use quite a lot and it's a word that's often misunderstood an archetype according to Jung uh, and he based his definition of archetype on Plato who called um, Jung's archetypes forms or ideas. An archetype is, is an essential idea that cannot be reduced any further. So let's say archetypes were not just people, they could also be ideas. So I'm going to give you an example of an idea that is archetypical because sometimes it's easier to see this. Beauty is an archetype or what Plato called an idea with a capital I. Now, beauty cannot be, you, you can't distill it down any further so that every human being has a concept of beauty. Every human being knows what we mean when we say something is beautiful. We know what beauty is, but each of us has a different idea of what is beautiful. So I might find one thing beautiful and you might find it ugly. Different cultures find different things beautiful and other things ugly. So the original idea, if you like, the archetypos, which is what archetype means, the original idea, is something that we all understand at a very fundamental level. Jung argued for this reason, that because we all understand what it is, it's in a sense a structure of the psyche. But every culture, every person sometimes, has their own particular iteration of it. Now, we can take this when we look at old women. So we would all have a concept of a, a divine old woman. An old woman of the world is the term that I like to use. An old woman who basically makes it go, makes it happen, keeps it running. But to Native Americans, she might be Grandmother Spider. To the Irish, she might be the Kaliach. In Slavic countries, she would be Baba Yaga. So she would wear different clothes, if you like, in different cultures but she's an example of the old woman archetype. Now, I am going to be using the word archetype to mean those iterations, those different cultural iterations, okay? But they're all part of the same basic idea that we understand. So with that preamble, let's look at some of the archetypes of menopause and let's look a little bit more deeply at menopause. We have, all of us, every single one of us, been born into a culture which teaches us that menopause is a disease, a failure, a dysfunction. Menopause is presented to us as a lack, very specifically a lack of estrogen, uh, which is seen to be the feminine, feminine, femininity and fertility hormone. And a lack of it, therefore, is perceived by the patriarchal uh, culture around us to be a bad thing. So we are taught to see menopause as an ending, and it is an ending of sorts, and it isn't quite natural to mourn an ending. We see some things happening to us in menopause. We see ourselves losing some things that perhaps we would rather not lose. But I believe very strongly that it is also a time of opportunity, and the culture focuses on the losses and the endings and not on the beginnings of the next journey. And Again, I think that is a great lack in the culture and teaches all of us uh, that, that older women really should be seen and not heard, a little bit like children, that they should be invisible, that they certainly shouldn't ever be inconvenient, and that they're just, you know, to be tolerated. But all of the old stories teach us that it was different, that older women were not tolerated, um, that actually they were cherished and they were listened to. So menopause is, is to me a time that for sure can be intensely physical, physically challenging for many women, not all, but for many women. But if we understand what is happening to us and why it is happening to us, then I think we can begin to perceive it as a time of opportunity. There was an idea um, or a quote that the late author Ursula K. Le Guin made and I can't remember exactly what it was, but she said something like, in menopause, women must be willing to become pregnant with themselves at last. So it's not about giving birth, <clears throat> excuse me, 
to other human beings. It's not about really anything to do with other human beings or relationships. It's about us. And it's about giving birth to ourselves at last. It's about growing into that person that we were always intended to be. And I believe very strongly that that shattering experience that many of us face during menopause is intended to strip away the things that are no longer necessary for us or useful for us in the second half of life so that we can kind of clear the decks and make way for something new to come in. In Hagitude, I talk about menopause as a kind of alchemical process. So in the old alchemical processes, you know, for, for part of it, you were in this wonderful vessel called a crucible and you were burnt, basically. Every, you were burnt back to the bone, a process that they called calcination. So again, everything was stripped away except the basic essence of the substance that was being alchemized. And I think that is what, if we are paying attention, that's what happens to us in menopause. That's what happens to us in, in pretty much all times of, of initiation and of, of difficult transition, but particularly in menopause. I think in a sense, it's literally a bonfire of the vanities. Um, we understand that we can't go on as we were, that we can't cling on to all of the things of youth because our body won't let us, it's changing. And there is a flow here that we can learn to go with. So yes, menopause, I believe, is a time between stories when we're waiting for a new story to emerge. And I believe that the stories of the old um, fairy tales and myths that have these wonderful archetypal old women in them can give us a little bit of inspiration for what that new story might begin to look like for each one of us. So a few interesting archetypes that I think are relevant to menopause. I have never met, I'm sure there are some, but I have never met or spoken to a, another woman about menopause who didn't say that a major feature of it for her was rage. Now, a lot of women um, don't know what it's necessarily like in, in your part of the world, but here I was certainly taught that good girls didn't get angry. I was never allowed to show anger. It was considered to be an unfeminine quality. And um, I think that the stripping away, the burning, the alchemical process that we undergo during menopause frees us of all of those restraints, if you like. And quite often, what happens is that all of the anger that we have been holding in, the way that women are treated, for example, and many other things in the world, tends to come out in menopause because it is a process of loss of control. Now, we're used to being in control. We're, we're used to holding everything together and holding everything in. But very often, and I certainly found it, whether I wanted to hold it in or not, anger broke out um, at the most inconvenient times during my menopause. And that was something that I was not expecting. There is a way, I, th I think that that can be a useful force if we learn how to harness it and transform it. Because there is a difference. And those of you who've read If Women Rose Rooted will remember at the end of the book that I talked about that. There's a difference between anger and rage in the sense of a lashing out and what you might think of as wrath, which has more of a sense of kind of, well, a, a moral aspect to it, I suppose, a kind of righteous wrath. And it's interesting to me that righteous wrath in classical mythology, in, in ancient Greece in particular, was the province of old women. Three very specific old women who were called the Furies. And they are some, they are found, these three old women, the Furies, are found in the earliest traces of Greek culture. So they're very, very old, not just in their appearance, but also they, they date back to the earliest of times, way, way be, be, uh, before the Olympic tradition of Zeus and Aphrodite and all of those gods and goddesses that we know very much better. And the Greek poet Hesiod names the three sisters, the three fates, as Alecto, who he described as unceasing in anger, and she was the punisher of moral crimes. There was Megera, 
the jealous one who punished infidelity, oath-breaking and theft. And there was Tisiphone, who avenged murder. And these three fates were said to be the daughters of Gaia, the goddess who personified the earth. So the wrath of the Furies could manifest itself in various different ways, but the purpose was for people to atone, you know, so they, they might punish, um, but they gave the opportunity for ritual purifications and the completion of a task that they would assign to the, uh, the offending person in order to atone. So it wasn't just that they punished, they gave the opportunity for remedying the situation. So they were respected, of course they were feared, but they were respected because they were perceived to be necessary. They represented justice and they were seen as the defenders of moral and legal order. They were described as foul smelling. Um, they had bat-like wings, black snakes adorning their hair and their arms and their waists and blood dripped from their eyes and they carried brass studded scourges in their hands. Now I'm sure all of us have had menopausal years where we could really go with that look. Um, but what I particularly like about the Furies is that they give the possibility of that generalized rage and anger being transformed into something that might be a little bit more functional. And I'm going to pick up on that in the second half of the afternoon when I talk about the archetype of truth teller and trickster, where I think it becomes particularly relevant, albeit in quite a complex way. So I want to just stop for a moment at that stage and open up for discussion because I don't want to keep talking forever and ever. And I'm interested, as far as we've gone, in what your perspectives are on female rage, how we can rehabilitate it, how we can transform it into something useful. And in that context, I want to say that, that one of the ways in which I learned eventually to think about it more positively, although it may not seem that, but it certainly did to me, is I, I felt that I, I, I worked a lot with the imagery of a volcano, having gone up to the top of a volcano in Nicaragua once upon a time and looked in and then dreamed for days and weeks afterwards about a woman coming out of a volcano and everywhere she trod, she set the earth on fire, not in a destructive way, but actually in a fairly powerful way. And so I began to think, instead of anger and rage, I began to think of fire and all of the positive things about fire, if it was contained, you know, if it was, if it were used properly, if it were used usefully, rather than being allowed to flow out of control, if it were channeled in a sense, I suspect I was thinking, which is kind of a little bit what the Furies were doing. So I'm interested in anything that any of you might like to contribute on this question of rage and how we rehabilitate female anger, because I think there is no question, but that the culture finds it very, very disturbing and sometimes actually positively frightening. So does anybody have anything that they'd like to contribute? If you would, then just raise your hand and I'll see you. Karen McGill McCall has her hand up. Okay, I'm sorry, I couldn't see that. Karen. That's okay. I'm just doing it the old fashioned way. Oh, I see. Um, they yeah. So I did have an experience of fury. This was uh, way beyond menopause, maybe 10, 10 years ago. I mean, excuse me, just a few years ago. But what happened to me is that um, my, and my husband watched this experience and I turned red and my body was shaking. And I actually lost energy, physical energy for about a year where I couldn't even walk to the mailbox, sometimes couldn't drive a car, this sort of thing. And um, I, I'm very curious about that relationship between that sort of cleansing fury and what it does to the body. But I know that um, in terms of the, the, the strictures that are around being female, I had had two friends 
who had very, very different political philosophies than I do. And I had always sort of looked beyond that to, to hold up loyalty and friendship and that sort of thing. And that was the moment where I said, no, there was another value for me that was so much stronger. And, and I think that that was my truth. Um, and even though it felt painful to part from these friends, it, it was interesting to feel, this was not a cognitive experience. This, there was something that emerged from me that was like, no, this is what is the most valuable thing to me. And I'm going to stand for it and I'm going to speak about it. And I'm somebody who is, you know, by nature, a peace builder and very conflict avoidant. So that was an interesting experience for me. Yeah, I think I think menopause dissolves many boundaries, you know, whatever it is that you have been restraining yourself from or that you have been told by the cultural narrative that you mustn't be or you mustn't do all of that. Again, if we if we are able to allow menopause to do its work on us or sometimes it's not a question of allowing it it just happens it breaks through then I think I think those boundaries dissolve and the the problem that I find often for people who go through that is again we're not taught that this is what happens uh certainly in the UK up until very recently there have, there's been very little in the way of cultural conversation about menopause. It's just one of those taboo things like menstruation that, you know, you didn't talk about in polite company. And so women are not really taught that all of this stuff will happen to them. They're taught about hot flushes, perhaps, you know, in the physical symptoms that we feel a little bit more comfortable with. But these profound psychological changes are, are really not been talked about very much at all, except in a few books that, you know, people might be lucky enough to happen across. And so I think we're not taught that we're going to feel this rage and therefore we don't have any concept of how rage might be a, a useful thing if we can find a way of channeling it. And it only becomes destructive when, as you're describing, you know, we're not allowed to express it. We have no useful channel for it and it can have major physical consequences. So, yeah, that is an issue. Uh, Catherine. Hi. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you bringing up not only the idea of rage, but the value in learning to channel it. Um, just uh, regarding my own life, I have both been subject to female rage with my mother, and that was just debilitating. And um, then I've also seen it expressed in my own life, you know, as a postmenopausal woman. Um, and so I felt that as well. Um, and it did not, in the end, it, it didn't get the results that I wanted. Um, the rage sort of just, I love the volcano idea. It just sort of comes from, yeah, the suppression of, of years of X, Y, and Z. And it's more of a release and an explosion. Um, but then I found it distances people and people that I love. And I would hurt people um, unintentionally. And I really, uh, in my journey, have looked at um, how best to work with that. Um, and I, I've noticed that there is um, an intention to engage with another person. So for me, the anger has become more of a clarifying factor, where I am more able now to look at truth. Mm -hmm. And um, but then the next step is how to engage with another that, um, especially in my important relationships, um, how to set that aside and listen to another. Um, but even then, I find that the rage helps keep me in touch with my truth. So now on my journey, that's how it's become useful for me is it clarifies and it helps me stay in touch with my truth mm -hmm. and with those boundaries. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and finally, Susan. Susan Ann. Wow, I have I'm, I have never looked at menopause quite through rage, but when you said that, it sparked something in me that was um, because at 49, right around that time, I was so flipping angry just 
incredibly angry. And I, I thought it was more about my marriage, which it was. And I can remember going up to the top of a mountain somewhere and just this rage in my stomach was just unbelievable right in the middle. And then I found underneath that was this very, very deep sadness as you are where you are because you brought yourself here. You have sacrificed these parts of yourself. Um, I was married when I was 18. I'm still married to the same guy. But what I said is I need a year. I need a year. When you asked, how did you deal with that rage? I said, I need a year. And it, curiously, it ended up being five years. We were geographically <laughs> separated because he moved to Hawaii to start a new business and I didn't follow but I was able to see what I looked like when I stood by myself, which I had never seen before. So that's how I dealt with it. I got a marriage sabbatical. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that's needed. Uh, if, if you, again, in the first half of life, we tend to define ourselves by relationships, uh, by relationships to others or by our place in the world or what our work is and what have you. And I think what menopause, one of the things it is designed to teach us is how to find who we are when we are set apart from all of that, either because it's stripped away from us or because we need to distance ourselves from it, whatever it might be, in order to be able to, to look at ourselves properly and fully. So, yeah, sometimes that happens. Uh, Polly, can you do it really quickly so we can move on? Would you correct in there? Yeah, absolutely. Just a quick little story. Um, right around the time that I was going through menopause and feeling that intense rage, one day in particular, I had a alt not even an altercation with my son, but but it just made me so mad, this this situation. And I got in the car to drive someplace and I just decided to just let it out. And I screamed and I screamed and I screamed with the windows up on a very hot day. <laughs> and it was the, 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 the sound of that truth coming out of my body was almost like a song. Like it was so beautiful for me to feel and hear my truth coming out. And once it was out, like I knew what to do. I knew how to talk to my son. I felt totally different in my body. And that the power of that moment has just stayed with me. It has been so instructive, you know, since that time. Yeah. And, and menopause for sure. I think if we haven't learned how to do that before, menopause, one of its gifts as well as its challenges is to teach us to listen to our body because there's all this stuff going on. It's not like you can ignore it. I mean, you know, women do often because, the, again, the cultural narrative tells us we must push on through. But when you do, as a consequence of all of these vast physical changes that are happening, learn to listen to your body and to, to take notice of what is happening at certain situations, it can actually be very powerful and a really good lesson for the rest of life. So thank you all for that. So other types of archetype that are relevant in menopause. One very, very powerful cluster of archetypes, I want to, to say, which fall under the category of medial woman. Now, the Jungians among you may already be familiar with this cluster of archetypes. And in 1956, Tony Wolf, who was um, a Swiss woman who was Jung's student as well as his lover, described what she believed to be four key female archetypes. They weren't the only ones, but she thought they were the most important to her at that time. This was 1956. The mother, the Hetaira, the Amazon, and the medial woman. I'm sorry, I've said that's a cluster of archetypes. What am I talking about? It's not. There are four different archetypes, and one of them is the medial woman. Now, she argued that, all, that although every woman has the potential to embody all of those different archetypes at various stages of her life, for most of us, there is one that particularly is important to us. Now, the woman who is most identified with a mother finds her primary identity in nourishing life, not necessarily her own children, but just nourishing um, the world around her, people around her. So she is defined by her relationship to those that she nourishes. The word hetaira, that's H-E-T-A-I-R-A, -E -A -A, refers back to a class of very highly educated women in ancient Greece 
who were part prostitute and part muse. They were to predominantly to provide them with long-term companionship. And so the Hetaira woman finds, according to Wolf, identity and fulfillment in different kinds of relationships, in that kind of muse kind of role, whether it be to a man or to a woman or whatever, that she, again, she's defined by her relationship to someone else. The Amazon is a capable, very resourceful woman who finds her pr primary identity and fulfillment in the outer world. She excels at work and at skills that are normally thought of as male. And again, she is defined by her role in the outer world, in the, in the world of work particularly. The medial woman is the only one of these four archetypes who is not defined in relationship to anybody else. She finds her primary identity in cultivating relationship with what Jung called the collective unconscious. In a sense, she's a mystic. There are different types of medial women, woman that I'm going to come into talking about in a moment. She's kind of a bridge. So medial women, for example, could be psychics or healers or visionaries or poets, just as, as examples. In some cultures, they might have been, back in the day, they might have been priestesses or prophetesses or shamans or oracles. And so if the medial woman archetype is active in us, then we're launched on a search for the kind of knowledge that we might think of loosely as mystical. So medial women are kind of seekers and keepers of, I guess you could call it esoteric knowledge or otherworldly knowledge and wisdom. And they're focused on direct personal mystical experience as opposed to the kind that you get from a religion a hierarchy the church or whatever dogma and doctrine doesn't come into it so i believe very strongly that particularly during our menopause years one of our key tasks is to uncover our own unique inner medial woman i think it is an archetype that we are all faced with in menopause every last one of us now we can choose to ignore it if we do it probably comes back knocking again later in life. But I think that that's what menopause does. It presents us with questions about meaning. What on earth is this for? And what am I going to do? You know, why, why would I have more decades of life? What am I going to do with them? So we're opened up to what Jung called the transcendent function, which is about fostering wholeness through a search for meaning. Now, there are a couple of... Um, a few different types of, of medial women that I talk about in Haggitude, and just to give you a little bit of a, a run through some of these women. I've talked about menopause as alchemy, as a kind of alchemical process of purification, I guess, stripping away everything that, well, the alchemists would have called it impure. It's not impure in the sense of that we would normally use the word, but but just superfluities, so that you get the essence of what the substance really is when everything is burnt or stripped away. And so we have the, arch the archetype of the al alchemist. Excuse me, just take a sip of water. <coughs> and the alchemist is really a mistress of transformation. So she's not afraid to strip things back to the bare bones to expose what lies beneath. She's kind of a visionary, but she's a catalyst for change. So she is a reimaginer, someone who wants transformation to happen in herself, in the people around her, in the world around her. And I think that is one key kind of medial woman. When we see or when we hear the word um, alchemist, we tend to think of those old medieval and later pieces of art which show, you know, heavily cl heavily clothed, bearded old men in dark laboratories with all kinds of arcane contraptions around them. But actually, many of the first very serious alchemists were women and actually invented a lot of the laboratory contraptions, the machinery that later came into use in chemistry. Alembic systems, for example, were invented by 
I think that was Cleopatra of Alexandria, not not the Queen and Cleopatra and Antony and all of that malarkey, but a different Cleopatra, who is an alchemist. Um, so women were alchemists back in the earliest of times, and we should always remember this. So that is an interesting idea to hold in our heads while we're going through these profound transformations. The, uh, another kind of um, medial woman is the mystic. I've said all of the, you know, in some way, all medial women are kind of mystics, but there is a specifically strongly focused mystic archetype. The example that I use in Hagitude is actually a real person rather than a story, and it's Hildegard of Bingen. And the reason I thought particularly of Hildegard of Bingen as one of the finest examples of the mystic archetype is because she, she did most of her work in the second half of her life. So I think it was when she was in her late 40s, she had a series of visions that inspired her to do her greatest work. And she was incredibly prolific. Um, she wrote songs, she, she grew herbs, she uh, wrote all kinds of treat treatises, she traveled Europe and advised men uh, and had a, a certain amount of power in the medieval church that was rarely acquired by women. And she did all of this whilst holding a very strong sense that the divine was also feminine. Now, this was unheard of in the medieval Christian church. You know, it was unheard of in Christianity in general for most of its history. But Hildegard talked about sapienta, wisdom, uh, which she perceived as a person kind of like wisdom in the Bible, I suppose, or Sophia. And she, she was unique again in those very, very male-focused patriarchal times in considering the divine to be just as much feminine as masculine. She also had a great passion for the natural world. This wasn't quite so unusual, but Hildegard was very, very overt about it, and it came through in all of her writings. She really accorded great importance to our relationship with the earth, which she saw and wrote about as a living organism that was possessed of the same vital power that animates all life forms, that animates humans, that animates animals. So that dates back, of course, to ancient philosophy and cosmology. But again, it was very rare to have that perspective in the Christian church, and particularly to be a confidant of the Pope while you were holding those views, as opposed to locked in dungeons with the, the Inquisition at you. So she had a word for this living force, which she called viriditas, the greening. So she spoke about the greening of the world and how important it was for us all to have an awareness of that. So she seems to me, in a sense, and this is just my preference, I suppose, to be the perfect, um, the perfect mystic because she's very grounded. It's very grounded mysticism. It's not all transcendental about escaping this world for some you know, perceived heaven. It's about our journey on this planet, in this life, in this physical incarnation. She accorded great importance to physical incarnation, which relatively few Christians of the time did. So the mystic is the second, the alchemist and the mystic. But perhaps better known than all of these is a third face of the medial woman, the archetype of the witch. Now, that is the witch is a witch is a character, let's say, that has a long and complex history, and we don't have time to go into it all today. I did do um, an online course for Roe a little while ago, a few years ago, which I think is still available if you really want to delve very deeply into the, the witch archetype. But, but in the earliest of times, the word witch, as I indicated at the beginning of 
this session was used mostly to refer to malevolent actors, people who wanted to do harm, either supernatural women who wanted to do harm to humans or human women who wanted to do harm to their neighbours. So which was universally negative. On the other hand, uh, this, sorry, this is this is in Europe um, in, let's say, well, it, over the past 2000 years. On the other hand, in classical times, again, we see characters called witches such as Medea and Circe, who were perceived perhaps not to be entirely positive, but nevertheless were perceived to have a very close relationship with the natural world, which wasn't all for the bad. So Homer's Circe, for example, lived in a forest glen. Ovid's Medea served the goddess Hecate from a temple deep in the woods. Their power came from elemental things, from rocks, from plants, from animals. So the witch, however she has been perceived, whether in a negative way or a positive way, has always had a very strong association also with the natural world and deriving power from the natural world. Now, I'm cutting a very, very long story short, but from this negative perception of the witch all the way through the witch trials, there was a different concept of the witch that started to come into being around the 1700s in Europe. And one of the men that really, it was a man um, who played a big role in this was a guy called Jules Michelet, who was a Frenchman who basically recast out of his own head, not based on any records at all, but recast witchcraft as a positive thing. He said that the wisdom of the witch was gained from a close knowledge of and relationship with the natural world and the universal life force, whatever you conceive that to be, and he believed that women were especially suited to such knowledge. So since Michelet in the 1700s, this idea of the witch as kind of communing with nature, often for good purposes, has really taken off. And again, to cut another very long story short, we see, we see this as responsible for the way that we think of as witches today in, in the pagan and neo-pagan world, and particularly the practice of things like Wicca, where the witch character specifically is encouraged to, to do no wrong but only to act, only to use the power of the natural world for the good of others. So complete reversal, if you like, from how the witch was perceived in the early days. So we have now this archetype of the witch in contemporary life as something that actually a lot of women aspire to be, because it's not any longer associated with negativity, with evilness, with warts or, <laughs> or ugliness or any of the things that witches were associated with in the past. And that revisioning of the witch, I think, is a great source of inspiration to many women. And the witch really is a very good example of the medial woman. The witch, I think, also is an interesting is an interesting character to think about in the context of the 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 problems that we bear as women today. So, if we go if we go back to the witch trials, and there is a narrative about the witch trials, which is incorrect. I'm afraid that millions of women were killed. There were several thousand women, probably the estimates when they've actually gone back, which people have, researchers have over the past 40 years, gone back into the records of places where witch trials were held. There's probably about 60 to 70,000 throughout Europe. And that's actually, um, uh, there is a, um, that, that is adjusted for places where no records were kept, but we can assume that a similar proportion of women would be killed. That is quite enough. We didn't have millions of women in Europe at the time, not very many anyway, you know, population was a lot lower, but it was a significant number of women and some men too, but almost always women. Um, 
And it was scattered throughout Europe. It was concentrated in some particular areas more than others, but it was scattered throughout Europe, except interestingly for the Celtic lands on the West. You don't see much of witchcraft in um, Ireland and Wales and in the Hebrides, the kind of islands, Western islands of Scotland. And there is also a narrative that these women were healers and um, herbalists and midwives. Actually, mostly they weren't. The sad story is that the midwives were often in cahoots with the people who were conducting the witch trials because they would be the ones who would examine the witches for all of the physical marks and signs that they were supposed to have. Some clearly were healers and herbalists and midwives, but the majority were not. The majority were women in the villages that were outsiders that didn't fit, the ones that didn't fit the ones that the neighbours weren't entirely sure of, the ones that lived alone, the older ones that looked a bit weird. Um, and that is a narrative that we can't prove necessarily, but that fits with most of the evidence that we, we often had women um, giving up other women, as you also saw in the Salem witch trials um, and other witch trials in America, that this was community against community or, or members of the community against other members of the community, rather than necessarily the church looking for heretics, didn't always come from the church. It often came from the community. And it seems to me that what many people have labeled the witch wound is based on that fear of being different, of being outside the system, of being perceived to be not in line with the cultural narrative. And I think that there is still a very strong psychological wound in the collective consciousness of women today that prevents us unless we're very strong, that prevents us from fully and fearlessly embodying the person we really feel ourselves to be. If that person that we feel ourselves to be is a little bit different from what the culture, the patriarchy, the men often, and some women would like us to be. And I think the witch wound for me is fear of being different. It's dread at the idea of speaking out against authority and being too different. So that archetype of the witch has many facets, I think, that can impact us during menopause. And afterwards, but particularly during menopause. There's another character that I won't spend too much time on, but I, I, I talk about her in Haggerty that I just want to mention who sits outside of this cluster of medial women archetypes. And she is, she is the main character who is not of the kind that I've been talking about, you know, the women who are outside the system, the women who are different, the women who challenge authority. She is very much in the community. And her name in European fairy stories is the Henwife. And perhaps some of you have read fairy stories where there is a henwife and it's normally the young heroine who goes to the henwife, ostensibly looking for eggs, but actually often finding that she gets more than she bargained for. The henwife is a woman who does keep chickens. So yes, yeah, she has eggs for sale. She tends to live in the village and quite often in the old stories, actively within the walls of the king's castle. And she is a character that I always think of as the keeper of women's mysteries, because women's mysteries being, you know, menstruation, marriage, birth, sex, all of that kind of malarkey, menopause too, although of course they don't talk about that in the old stories. And so the heroine often finds advice about marriage from a henwife, you know, who she should marry, how she should dress in order to attract the suitor that she wants. And she can be quite 
she's almost always a very benign character who's dishing out really, really useful advice. There's only one or two stories where she can be a little bit less benign. But the henwife is the keeper of women's mysteries as, as a kind of everyday wise woman that young girls can go to to get advice and help is also a very quite a prominent character you know she appears in many different fairy tales and so she's always to me worth thinking about who who did who was that person you know in every cult in every village and in the community that was clearly seen to be an important role that an older woman could have to dish out this advice about marriage, about sexuality, and so on. So, if so, again, just to, to recap on this, if I look at archetypes of the time around menopause, the kind of more midlife before we pass out of menopause and into elderhood, we have the Furies who appear to be usefully working with the rage that happens to a lot of women in midlife. We have the medial woman, and the examples I gave were the alchemist, the mystic, and the witch, which is the call that we tend to feel at this time in menopause and around menopause towards a more inward-looking search for meaning. When I say inward looking, I don't mean focused, you know, on the interior of our own head. I mean, just not out there building and growing and doing a lot of stuff. And we have the hen wife, who appears to be this very down to earth, grounded um, advisor on what we might think of as women's mysteries. So these are the key archetypes that I talk about in Haggertude. And what I'd like to do now, Fia, if that is okay, with you is. is to have have you go into breakout groups let's say for for 20 minutes this time around and just talk about those archetypal characters and i know it's always a real temptation but it would be lovely if rather than just sharing stories of your own experiences of menopause if you could try to do that in the context of these different types of experience that are embodied by these archetypal characters. So the rage, the, the, the tendency towards mysticism or the search for meaning, and that sense of really wanting to delve into what we might think of as women's mysteries, women's physical experience in a much deeper way than perhaps we've had time for in our younger years. And just to have a general conversation about the ways in which, if at all, and perhaps they don't, in which case that's also interesting to hear, the ways in which these archetypes showed up in your own experience of menopause, if you've already had it, or you think might show up if you're kind of on the brink or in the middle of it. So, okay, Fia, I don't know how many people have we got. If we put, if we have groups of... I, I have groups of four and five. Four and five. That's perfect. Thank you. So if we do that, and then if we can come back at five past the hour. Yep. I've given them 20 minutes. Brilliant. And then we'll have a discussion about all of that. Okay. I won't go into a group. Um,
Okay, I think that's everyone, is it, V? Should be. Great. Okay, so let's get going again. So um, I'd like to, <coughs> excuse me, invite maybe somebody from each group to say a little something about what you discussed. Not all of it, but just to share one thing from your discussion. Who would like to volunteer to go first? <coughs> Excuse me. I'll stop picking on people if you don't volunteer. Okay, Polly. Well, I would guess, I guess I would say just one, one thing we spoke about was um, feeling like we are part of a, a global gl groundswell of, um, of women who are um, at a point in their lives where they are looking for and wanting to bring something different to this enormous problem that we are all facing as a planet and that um this the the it's not going to be announced that this is happening <laughs> but that we can all feel we can feel what's happening and we can jump into it because we know it's happening and we're part of it thank you yeah i would i would agree with that for sure alma The audio okay? Yep. Okay. So the commonality was the rage as well as the media woman. And I just it just opened up a door for me to really think deeper about that. And any words you may have to share of the somehow the alchemy of rage and media woman would be I appreciate sharing. And I'm sure the others in our group would too. I'm not sure I've got anything general more to say. If you have a specific question, I'd be very happy to answer it in, in any particular context. I think I'm having trouble putting a question together. I'm a slow thinker, slow processor. So just want to thank you. But it's interesting to find that there is that commonality, and I think just the experience is more shared than we actually end up sharing it globally. And yeah. One percent of the population, so there's a lot of energy and power in that. Indeed, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think you're you're absolutely right about the commonality. And the, the sad thing, in a sense, is that this is only uncovered in very limited places and very limited environments in in the UK at the moment, or certainly over the past, oh, I don't know, a couple of years, perhaps, there has been a big opening up of conversations around menopause. But almost all of those conversations are about holding on to everything that you're losing at all costs. And so even conversations about hormone replacement therapy which of course, you know, for many women can be very necessary to, um, to help with the most severe physical symptoms. That isn't being talked about as something that can help with physical symptoms. It is presented as something that you must take in order that you may remain youthful and beautiful and, you know, plump cheeked and what have you forever. And so Although it seems on the one hand to be a good thing that there are more conversations are having, it does seem are being had, it does seem to me that a lot of the conversations are heading in the wrong direction. But whenever I've been in a place, you know, done an event, given a talk, or just been in conversation with other women, when you start to talk about this, everybody recognizes it. So I really do think it's important in whatever ways we can. And of course, that differs for all of us to be able to have these conversations. And I think, you know, we, we gain confidence from understanding that really almost all of us are in the same place. It's just that we're not talking about it yet. So we're not going to be perceived to be mad or really out there. And um, I think it is something that everybody is going to breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh, thank goodness, I thought it was just me. And I think that 
the ability to have those conversations and also to share some of the stories and the archetypal characters, you know, is 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 part of this healing process, I think, that that older women need to go through in order to regain their voices in a world that is still desperately trying to take them away from us. So, yeah. Catherine. Hi. Uh, well, just really quick before I share what our group um, discussed, uh, in addition to hormone replacement, I've noticed with circles of friends that I have and as a therapist, clients, um, it's really common um, for antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication to be prescribed to menopausal women when they report symptoms to their doctors. So I just wanted to, to note that trend as well. Um, but our group, what we discussed um, had to do with um, some highlights, uh, rage as um, more of an end result of built up anger that has gone stale and rotten. Um, the idea of overculture suppression of women's feelings that kind of lead to this buildup in addition to self-suppression, um, what we also sort of do in our own lives. Um, the idea of the experience of power as a woman in the family versus out in the overculture. Uh, and then one other highlight that we talked about was the idea of early menopause brought on by surgery, whereas uh, chronologically, there's not the alignment of older women, and yet some of the experience is the same, if not all. So th that's what we talked about. Brilliant. That sounds like a good conversation. Would anybody like to, before we move on, would anybody like to ask a question, make a comment about what we've done so far? Because we're going to be moving out of menopause now. I just, I'm a little bit curious, and I think you said it, but it struck me and it came up in our group as well, that the I think there might be a difference between in the United States the the crone has been more reclaimed here and it, there's a difference maybe between the crone and the hag um, being the crone being pushed away I I don't find it quite as um, push away maybe there's yeah. Mm, that, that's interesting. Uh, it, it is. I, I do see a, a big difference in use of that word in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, across across uh, either side of the ocean. And all I all I was trying to refer to at the beginning was the way that it's used in the old folklore. So in, mm -hmm. in the old fairy tales, mm -hmm. the crone would always just would just always be old. That's just, you know, that's just fact. But again, it's a little bit like the words that we've been talking about. The, the witch, for example, they change over time and they should rather than standing still. And if that's the case, it's kind of interesting. So perhaps it's not such a difference as um, as I was anticipating, so. It's really cool, thank you. Susan you're muted. You're muted, Susan My question kind of ties into that because I was in the same group. And so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on do archetypes evolve? I mean, can, okay. Yeah. Can yeah. we, um, like the crone archetype here, there's a whole group of women who have added a third stage, maiden, mother, matriarch, and crone. And there's a lot of pushback against that. And so I'm just wondering what your thoughts would be. Well, that's interesting, you know, because Maiden Mother Crone has no reality in mythology. Um, I promise you that's true. Um, it was an invention of a, a writer called Robert Graves, a British writer who wrote a book called The White Goddess, in which he perpetrated many evil things against Celtic mythology. In other words, he made a lot of stuff up. Um, he was a poet. He was presenting it as his kind of personal view of what he might like to have been the case but it a lot of it wasn't he talked about what did he talk about the 
it was the Celtic, the Celtic tree calendar or the Celtic something, some Celtic calendar, month by month associated with trees. Complete invention. Absolutely did not exist. Unquestionably did not exist. So um, Graves was one of, yeah, it, it, I promise you it's true. I've, I have a master's degree in all of this stuff and I've studied it because I'm curious about how these things come into being. It doesn't matter in the sense that if it's useful, use it. The only time that I get irritated sometimes is when people present it as, you know, everybody had this idea of Mother Maiden Crone uh, way back into the past. They didn't. But 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 Mother Maiden Crone, you know, these are times of life that all of us recognize. So, you know, I have no problem with that. I just wanted to clarify that it is not an old thing. Therefore, if you think it is appropriate to add in an extra stage of life, I think that's very fine, particularly since we are now living longer. And it has always seemed to me that that mother period is a little bit too long um you know so i guess I, I don't know necessarily i hadn't thought too much myself about what i would call it if i were to do my own kind of fourfold system but i think it makes sense maybe to insert one because we are all living longer um the question the more general question of whether archetypes evolve is a really good one and they were always designed to so Particularly, Jung changed his thinking during the course of his life quite a lot. You know, he was an old man. He worked very hard. He studied very deeply and very honestly. And towards the end of his life, he started to change his mind about some things that he'd been very, fairly sure of when he was younger, which is a very healthy process. When Jung was younger, he thought of archetypes as being part of the human experience, as being structures of the human psyche, that they were in a sense part of us, you know, that we kind of I don't want to say we invented them, but it would be something close to that. As he got older, he began to, to, to align himself more with the old Greek, let's say the Platonic ideas of ideas and forms, which were archetypes by any other name, which was that, no, actually, they have an independent existence. They're part of, according to Plato, to put it simplistically, they would be part of the world soul, the anima mundi. They have an independent existence and they can happen to us. We didn't make them up. You know, that would be an arrogant thing to assume. Um, they are out there embodied um, sometimes in, in landscape, um, appearing in stories. But the whole point of them was by having an independent existence, of course, they must grow and transform just as we must grow and transform. That's what we're here for. And there is a sense in, in which I believe very strongly that if we try to confine the archetypes to, you know, whenever we came across them first, then we, we stop them from growing. We kind of squeeze the life out of them. They lose power. They lose force. And one of the books that I always quote when I'm talking about this is Leslie Marmon Silco's book, Ceremony, because she talks about ceremony in the same way that I would talk about story or archetype. She has in that book, her Native American medicine man, Bethany, say that if you if you don't allow the ceremonies to grow, you kill them effectively. You know, this idea that you must keep everything the way it always was, even though the world has changed and changed and changed, is not a good thing either for the culture or for the ceremonies themselves. And it wouldn't be a good thing either for, the, for us or for the archetypes. So to artificially confine our idea of what some of these archetypes are to a point in time 2000 years ago, let's say, when our ancestors were working with them, doesn't necessarily seem to me to be healthy. But what I like is when, is when they grow of their own accord. You know, we don't try to change them. We don't force anything upon them. We're not the ones changing them, but they appear to have changed across the, the course of time, if that makes sense. So... The only thing that as a kind of scholar of these things, I suppose, as I said earlier, I, I really am keen that we we talk about ancestral wisdom. We actually know what was ancestral wisdom and what wasn't. Um, but we shouldn't really try to confine ourselves. The archetypes have got to grow. So thank you. That was a good question. Uh, Kathy. Um, I guess. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. OK, great. Um, my question is around the, the process of getting in touch with these archetypes and to what degree 
Is it an individual process? And to what degree is it important to do it in community with other women? And historically, what did that look like? Did women come together to support each other? It, it, to support each other in what? In, in, in the process of, I guess, understanding, finding their authentic selves. Um, processing life and discerning and finding and making meaning all of all of what this is getting to essentially I, I guess I mean it's really hard to tell you know and I'm not a cultural historian so I I, I haven't or an anthropologist so I don't really uh know chapter and verse on that but you know certainly we look back in uh, even in Irish culture for example women W women together told stories that were different from the stories that, that that were told when men were present. So if we just look at the Cayley, where stories were exchanged in houses, particularly in the winter in the evenings to kind of pass the time, um, the men tended to tell sagas, heroic stories, whereas the women tended to, which are thought of as kind of like, you know, high art, <laughs> Finn and Cúchulainn and all those, um, all of those fine men. Whereas the women tended to tell the the stories that would be th thought of as folk tales, you know, stories from the people or fairy tales, stories about their interaction, their own personal interaction or the, the interaction of the community with the other world. And so if that is the and that is recorded uh, that the, that happened, that women got together in their, you know, sewing or weaving circles or whatever and exchanged these stories now. Did that lead to deep conversation about their lives? It's kind of hard to imagine knowing women that it wouldn't, you know. So I suspect is probably as much uh, as, as I can offer. I'd be very, very surprised if that didn't happen. You see the same in reference to the same kind of things in, in um, Greek texts where women, particularly when weaving, um, created a you know a particular kind of story magic when they would have talked about these things or they've talked about the mythology and their cosmology or their religion whichever you want to 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 do so to to refer to so I think I women today clearly do that too but I I really like to envision envision the idea of us gathering in circles and talking more about stories one of the things as a consequence of Hagitude or uh, around Hagitude that I'm working with is we have a a, a year-long program beginning next uh, actually this time next week where we're looking precisely at things like this the, the kind of resources that we need as elder women but also the way in which we can spark change in the world you know we how how we can seed stories out there how we can find or um, organize or promote groups of older women talking together, but not just about their life experiences, but about these bigger issues, about these stories, about these archetypes, about the ways in which it is possible to seed elder wisdom into the world. If you're interested in that, you can look at hagitude.org. That's the website. But these are really, really important questions, I think, not just for ourselves to try to understand where we are in our lives, but to, to figure out how we can begin to really transform this cultural conversation around menopause and growing older. Thank you. Hilary. Thank you, Sharon, so much. Um, I, as a medial woman, <laughs> I was very struck by what you said around the witch trials and the, and the potential wound to the collective unconscious of women in this uh in our struggle menopausal struggle to become authentically who we are i'm wondering if you can say more about your thoughts about that i was very struck as when i went to i grew up in new england and went to salem massachusetts and learned a lot about the witch trials there and was horrified i mean it was it was but i never thought about it as a potential um unconscious collective you know unconscious collective wound to us as women both in Europe and here yeah I mean I don't know that I have a huge amount more to say than that I, I do think that in whatever way you might imagine this stuff is passed down I do think these huge 
periods of time in our history where women were frightened to be women, were frightened to open their mouths, were frightened to be different, you know, were frightened to um, to cross swords with a neighbor in case they were turned in to, um, to the witch finders. It's, it's inconceivable, isn't it, in a sense, you know, this happened over, over centuries, that we wouldn't in some way bear the mark of that and, and the wound of that. And I, I think we don't, again, it's one of those things that we're not taught to think about, um, that kind of historical wounding of women in so very very many ways and I think a lot of people and I see it particularly in younger women now who have not gone through perhaps the the really difficult period of uh, fighting for women's rights you know who uh, and I don't mean this in any way to be demeaning to, to younger women but it's just a different age they're born into a different age where more not everything is possible but more is possible and that fight for just the right to do things like vote or you know um go to the doctors and get contraception without your husband having to sign an agreement and all of that kind of thing so much is taken for granted now but i think i think it shouldn't be because i think even those women even the younger women will find themselves acting in certain ways fearing certain things you know, without even necessarily being able to put it into words and or, or bring it to the top of their consciousness. It's just, it, it's inconceivable that we wouldn't. You know, during the Victorian period in England, women were constantly locked up in asylums by husbands who decided they didn't like the fact that they disagreed with them sometimes. You know, every phase of history has some kind of atrocity that was perpetrated on women for having the audacity to have a voice and it has to affect us it has to affect us even if we believe that things are different now even if we can point to things that are different laws that apparently protect us you know i grew up reading those books both at school for english literature and also in my spare time and it frightened the hell out of me um and i think for a long time when i was in my teens i was i i i didn't entirely believe that that wasn't still a risk at some at some level so I suppose that's what you know in a very general mode that is what I am thinking of but the witch women particularly it's really interesting how many women who have a throat problem that makes them uncomfortable that they feel as if something is being you know that their neck is being squeezed I, I can't tell you how many women have that or have had it at some point in their lives and and so many of them at least in in my part of the world will say oh I'm sure I was hung as a witch or something like that you know it just comes out uh that sense that this is in this that this would have happened to our ancestors to our physical genetic ancestors and that in some way, you know, we carry that fear maybe in our genes. Now I am a scientist and I'm not sure what the mechanism for that would be, but I still believe that it might be the case. Well, I'm also thinking of Jung's line of what is not something to the effect of what is not brought to consciousness can return to us as fate. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. It, it, it makes me really think about, maybe I need to spend more time with this, <laughs> you know, and uh, go back over all of that period of history and because you're right it was so extensive too it was not five years <laughs> no it was a very very long time and i think there there although it seems it can seem glib if it's not done deeply but i do think that there is an interesting power in reclaiming some of these words and some of these archetypes and revisioning them for for different times, you know, so I kind of like the way that the witch archetype has been completely rehabilitated, pretty much. I mean, you know, certainly for certainly for women, um, that nobody that everybody wants to be a witch now. You know, everybody wants to be. Everybody sees that as a as a kind of cool label. Well, not everybody, but most people that I would mix with would. <laughs> um, and I like the idea that we could do the same for other female archetypes like hag or like crone or whatever well you're suggesting it already has been done for crone in north america just because we need to take back the things that were the things that we used against us 
And if we are alchemists, and I do believe that all women who certainly who've gone through menopause come out of the other end in some fashion, if we're still alive and functioning, um, even if it's hanging by a thread some days, at some level we are alchemists. And that is about not letting things stagnate, but constantly creating the feminine force. And I don't mean gender, I mean the feminine principle is creative, relational, transformative. And it seems to me that that is a, a job, I suppose, we have, particularly as older women. So Ursula Le Guin said, you know, we begin to birth ourselves for the first time. But I see also, and probably this will come up in the second half when we're talking about elder women archetypes, I see in a sense that we're birthing culture. You know, so on the one hand, we're turning inwards and birthing ourselves, but then particularly as we move out of menopause and, and the older we get, I see it in so many women, this sense of service to the wider community or world, that that is birthing culture. So it's still the same thing, birthing, nourishing, giving you life, creating, that the feminine principle has. But at different times in our life, we just apply it to, to different, different stuff. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because we're that's part of one of the archetypes that we'll look at later on. Okay, well, thank you. Oh, Karen, uh, it's Karen. Karen. Yeah. Hey, um, so um, I'm, I'm thinking that it's, this is such a timely thing to be talking about, not only because we're talking about trying to heal historic wrongs that have become internalized into our psyche, but there are I'm just thinking from the perspective of the United States, um, but of course this is true worldwide, but we are seeing so many external threats to women's freedom and autonomy. So, um, and the other thing, I'm, I'm a naturalist and there's this term, a search image. And once you know what you're looking for, you know, you see the picture of the woodcock or whatever it is, then you start finding it. And by the like, like token, having these, um, these descriptors of the different archetypes, I think really helps us identify more sort of amorphous knowings that we may have. And I, I find it so helpful when we have these definitions, whether it's of words or archetypes, um, then I, I can tap into these elements of myself that may have been more opaque. And then it helps me behave in a way that is clearer and more intentional. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's interesting as well is, and this is something else that we are um, going to be looking at during the course of the year ahead in our program, is what, what archetypes are missing. You know, because again, these are old stories. So there may be opportunities for women to display a particular character or a particular type of wisdom now that there weren't when these stories were told and were, were written down. So uh, again, in the spirit of constantly kind of reinventing what is possible and constantly allowing the archetypes to grow. So that's another interesting story. What's missing from this lot? Mm. At the end of the session, you can tell me. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let's take our break now and uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about archetypes post-menopause. And if we come back at the top of the hour, so that's six o'clock here and one o'clock there, will that be for you? Or at least in, on the East it's Coast. It's one o'clock on the East Coast. <laughs> okay. Brilliant. So then we'll go through the rest of it. See you then. I think we're just I think we're just about on the hour, so let's get started. So as I said earlier, I think there are certain aspects of that journey into elderhood that all of us share, even if it wears different faces. The encounter with a medial woman particularly being something that I think we all face during menopause but I think that what happens in the years following menopause will be different for each of us that you know we're all unique in reflecting the infinite variety of the <clears throat> of the universe and so I think we consequently embody elderhood in uniquely different ways we each have our own exceptional gift and our own particular vision for the world and now is the time to begin to uncover them. There are various tools that you can use to uncover your vision. 
but again, to me, one of the greatest tools of all is stories and looking at the archetypal characters in them. So in Hagatude, I, I use that quote, which is often uh, or always attributed to, to Michelangelo. Um, I saw the angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. And instead of an angel, I'm seeing an inner hag at this time of our lives. So we carve until we set our inner hag free. Again, that process in menopause of stripping away leaves us wondering what the essence is and how do we reveal to ourselves, let alone to the world, what that inner hag is. So we're going to look at one way of doing that through story and archetype again. So I'm going to introduce some of the archetypal old women in European myth and folklore. In all of the stories that I read and that I discovered, these are the women that came out. Uh, as I said they, earlier before we broke, there may be more uh, in stories that I haven't uncovered, haven't found any yet, but I, I do live in hope um, that, there are, that there are other archetypal ways of embodying an, an elder woman's wisdom. So I'm not in any way presenting this as a definitive list, you know, or a list that this is all there is. I'm sure there is more, but these are the ones that really stood out in the main stories that I focused on. One thing I want to say before we go, we begin to go through the individual archetypes, the, the nature, the archetypal older women in our stories are not like many of the younger female characters, the protagonists, the princesses, the young girls. They're not simple and straightforward characters, more often than not. Often there is a complexity about them. And so very few of them fit easily into the unequivocal goody versus baddie typology that we appear to be so enamored of in parts of this world. They often appear in the guise of what we might call the dark feminine. They're slightly mad, they're more than a little bad, and almost always dangerous to know. When we think of the dark feminine, except for those of us who have encountered it and worked with it, and I'm sure many of you have. But when we think of the dark feminine, we tend to imagine the terrible mother, uh, the death goddess, the exiled and spiteful fairy at the christening. We tend to think of the evil hag, the wicked witch, you know, the Hansel and Gretel witch who swallows up the lives of lost children rather than trying to find one of our own. The that notion of the dark feminine does indeed incorporate a series of archetypes that our culture finds problematic. But the truth is that these older women in the stories are not incontrovertibly negative. They're ambiguous, I guess. And to me, that is the nature of life, you know. Um, we don't see all good and all bad. And the older women, very much more than the younger women in these stories, reflect that ambiguity. So the negative aspects of the dark feminine might, if we're looking at it in Jungian terms, reflect the shadow of the hag, you know, the all devouring hag, as opposed to the hag that wants to, the hag that just wants things to die rather than the hag that wants things to die in order to, to be reborn. But these often simplif simplified, oversimplified, classifications are encouraged by an overculture which really does specialize in trivializing and demonizing women and so we don't much encounter the other faces of the dark feminine which is the rebirth that comes after death uh, the healing um, and all of this to me does women a great disservice because it means that we don't really delve deeply into the dark feminine we're taught to avoid it because it's bad it's evil we don't delve deeply enough into the dark feminine to find at the heart of the paradox you know that that good and evil can kind of coexist in one person um we don't delve into the complexity we don't learn to sit with uncertainty we don't learn to sit in a place of non-judgment and there are many many gifts of the dark feminine that i think many of these characters can help us to uncover. 
there's you know we have destruction but creation comes out of destruction creation comes out of chaos in the oldest greek uh, cosmology we have wrath we have a very fierce compassion we have um, eroticism we have spiritual ecstasy all of these very uncomfortable things that the culture doesn't quite know what to do with these are part of what we might call the dark feminine the culture many in the culture are frightened of it but it's necessary for life without which everything stagnates and that's never a good place to be in so expect these older women to be ambiguous they're above all creative full of energy transformative energy teaching us in a way that there really can't be growth without pain or challenge or unpredictability or uncertainty and that that is okay that that is the nature of transformation and especially it brings us i think awareness of the dark i have a great love of the dark i don't mean the bad evil dark but um Again, in many parts of the culture, we're taught to think of dark as a negative concept and, you know, love and light is the only thing that matters. Again, these characters help us hold the two together at the same time. It's not even about balance. It's literally holding two apparently opposing things together at the same time and seeing that it's a good thing. So each of these women in the stories encapsulates encompasses um, expresses a different aspect of what i am calling haggitude which to me is is the essence of hag and i described hag at the beginning remember is that sense of your own power not defining yourself by anybody else or by anybody else's rules or with it or confined and by anybody else's structures or having your strings pulled by the puppet masters of the overculture it's about being authentically yourself and that to me is what haggitude really effectively is each of the women expresses a different aspect of it again not definitive probably more but let's just look at some of the ones that i pulled out the first one is the archetype of the creatrix so these are old women who in the old myths and fairy tales quite literally weave the world into being. Think of the fates in Greek mythology. Now, in art, in visual arts, the fates are often depicted by male artists as beautiful young women. In all of the texts, they were old women. They were three sisters, Clotho, the spinner, Lachesis, the allotter, and Atropos, the unturnable which was a metaphor for death. Can't turn it back. It's going to happen. Sometimes she was also called the cutter. Everyone had to submit to the fates, not just humans, but the gods. Again, like the three furies, these three old women were old. They were older than the Olympians. They were there at the beginning. They always had this idea. And the fates are often kind of caricatured a little bit, I would say, as women who, you know, doled out bits of destiny to humans who said, this is the way your life is going to be and it can't be changed. So, you know, sorry, you're going to die or marry a mother or do something appalling like that. But that's not how it was in the oldest stories. Really, the fates presided over nothing less than the entire natural order and balance of the cosmos. So the fates, that was their job, to keep the cosmos in balance. So the fates would step in if somebody took more than they were entitled to, or if somebody took something that was not for them, or if somebody took too much. And then they did deal out something that might be conceived of as a punishment but this was because if just one person took something that they shouldn't marry their mother, for example, if we're looking at Oedipus as one example that probably everybody knows, then that puts the entire cosmos out of balance. And the balance has to be put back. And that was the fates. That was the role of the fates. They were, again, the old women with the big picture. They could see all of the patterns and they knew when something was out of sync. 
and they were the ones who understood precisely what had to be done to make it work again, even if that something wasn't very pleasant for somebody somewhere in the world. So again, three old women in some of the oldest European cosmology were the ones who did that. The grandmothers, the old women. The mother in, in some Greek texts, um, so for example, in Plato's Republic, the mother of the three fates is called Ananke, A-N-A-N-K-E. And her name in Greek means necessity. And that is to convey the fact that the fates acted out of necessity. It was necessary for the world to remain in balance. And every soul, Plato believed, came into the world carrying their own necessity, which they agreed in collaboration with Ananke before they came into this world. And then, of course, promptly forgot because that would be no fun if we actually remembered what we were here to do. Um, necessity, um, Ananke is, is always also depicted carrying or holding a spindle. And in Greek mythology, she was said to have formed the universe and embedded this order, this natural balance into it. So that sense of weaving, that sense of spinning, we see that in so many places. We see it in um, the Norns in Scandinavian mythology, who weren't always depicted as old, but were depicted as spinning again, you know, the world into being. We see it in... Um, the figure of Mother Holle in Greek mythology, who was the subject in, in um, German folklore, who was the subject of a Grimm's fairy tale, who was an old woman who lived at the bottom of a well, and she spun and spun and spun, and she was clearly related to an old Germanic goddess who again made the world and kept it going. So this idea of old women as creatures creatrixes is very very common and really very prevalent how does this archetype show up in our lives today because we don't all have the power to weave the world into being how does it show up well art well first of all i think there is often a late blooming of creativity you know in many people i mean jung who, who clearly was not a woman so it's not just for older women jung described how late in his life after a heart attack uh, that was life-threatening how his creativity and his insight and his the, the whole nature of his work really blossomed and we see that in many female artists and art of course can be but any kind of art can be a vehicle for social transformation. So one of the examples I use in the book is Judy Chicago, um, you know, whose art celebrated women at all levels and whose, whose exhibitions, in fact, she had one um, that was based on weaving women, really were designed to highlight to the culture aspects of womanhood that had been erased from the cultural conversation. So you don't have to be the fate spinning the world into being. You can be an artist and you can highlight things that need to be highlighted, but then not all of us are great artists and craftspeople. How does this show up if you're not an artist or a craftsperson? How do you think? Over to you. Question, hands up. How does that archetype show up, do you think, in our lives if we're not? blessed with brilliant artistic skill because that's something i have wrestled with myself how do we make this archetype relevant anybody have anything to offer otherwise we'll park it maybe for your breakout groups but i think there is an element again of creativity in what we might think of as the feminine principle that doesn't have to be about creating great works of art. Creating a beautiful garden, creating a beautiful home, creating a safe environment. I mean, I think all of these, in a sense, are part of the same function. But the trick with these old stories is making them relevant. Okay. Um, Trish. Um. It's interesting that you brought up Jung here and this 
compulsion to create that happened to him after that. And I guess the thing is, I don't know that that has anything to do with some sort of judgment of the quality of the result. Although I'm amazed going through what he did, um, how little we've seen it in, in the culture, because he actually was quite amazing. But it was more of uh, this journey and exploration of what wanted to be expressed. And in that way, like you're speaking about all the different ways, I, I think that we come to a place where that expression, maybe that's post the rage part, that expression needing to come out in some way that is, um, creative rather than destructive is kind of interesting yeah indeed indeed it's a life force basically yeah um Catherine. right like the martha like the martha the graham quote that there is a life force within us that longs to be expressed and onions men as well that you know that that's in us so strongly yeah, indeed. Yeah. Catherine. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the power of uh, reinvention, of reinventing ourselves, sort of giving ourselves permission in our lives to make different choices that we may not have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Margaret. Maybe following up on Catherine's, I, I was hearing Catherine's comment and sort of the macro level of a big sh shift we can make in our lives. But I was thinking about the creativity just moment to moment. Uh, if we're if we're in touch with our own aliveness and not sort of working on automatic pilot, there's a creativity moment to moment of how how shall I respond? What what's the healing word I should say here? What is this a moment to be silent? It, it, it feels to me very creative once we're when we're really connected to ourselves and to spirit. Uh, we're all creative. We're, we have that invitation. Wonderful. Thank you. Kathy. Um, I was thinking about um, how throughout my life, when I've followed my passion, I've ended up being creative in, in so many ways. So whether it was um, doing programming of some sort, workshops, gardening. Um, yeah, so I, that's, I guess that's always been a pathway for me that has taken me to that place. Interesting. Yeah. And I did want, yeah, I did want to say when I talked about, you know, creating a, creating a garden or creating a house, I mean, a garden or a house, that 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 in in its own small, seemingly small way, is an example of balance. Mm. You know, so the fates are looking at balance in terms of the whole world, but we can look at balance and harmony in terms of whatever environment we can impact. Mm. Yes. So the bigger picture in the myth comes down to a smaller sphere of influence that we have compared to the fates. So yes, absolutely. And finally, Susan Ann. So that was a really beautiful question and it took me a minute to kind of grab it. But what came up was the way women are circling, the way women are circling all around the world and stories, weaving stories together, you know, sitting in circle and weaving stories. So I think that's kind of how it's been showing up from, you know, in my life. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Terrific. So that's one, the creatrix, old women weaving the world. Next, force of nature or guardians and protector of the land. And here, the prime example that we come back to is that old woman of Irish and Scottish Gaelic mythology, the Cailleach. Um, She is portrayed as, in a sense, embodying the land but in a particular way so she's almost a kind of geological force you know um she's particularly enamored of rocky places so 
serious geology in those places, as well as being as old as time. But she doesn't just embody the land, she clearly fashioned it. So we have these wonderful stories of her carrying, you know, she's a giant old woman who carries stones in her apron and then she trips over and the stones fall out and they create mountains. So there really is a sense of shaping. But also, particularly in Scottish mythology, she is seen as a guardian of the wild things. So there are numerous stories, particularly in the Scottish Highlands, of a Caliach figure who prevents hunters from taking pregnant deer at the time when they are pregnant and you know promises him a stag if he will leave her deer alone but only one stag because that's enough and so again there is this sense of balance of just taking enough she weeps over the cut forests and and yet she is a, a very strong character you know she is this giant, rocky, serious, not to be messed with old woman who you do not ever take lightly. And I like the idea that we have fierce old women like that in our mythology, because again, it kind of gives us permission to, to see that as an option for us, because these myths arise out of a culture in which certain things were possible. And if it wasn't possible, we couldn't imagine that, then you wouldn't have the myth and the folklore. So I always find, particularly in a catastrophically environmentally challenged world, I always see the figure of the Kaliak as a particularly fine archetype. We need that sense of protecting the natural world, of guarding it. And the Kaliach was always the old woman in the stories who knew exactly when to say no, enough. So she is probably one of my favourite characters, I would say, um, partly because it's my culture, my stories, but, but also because she is so very, very strong and rocky. Fairy godmothers. Not always, as in the Disney world, twinkly and taffeta with stars on their wands, not always at all that. We have these older women as mentors to the young, normally to a young girl, because that's just the way that stories seem to go, but they are mentors to the young. And, and the fairy godmother seems to me to be a particularly important archetype because particularly for women who do not have children either by choice or not by choice we can't all be grandmothers but we can all be fairy godmothers and this sense of kind of taking under your wing a child a young person that needs help and advice is old 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 it appears we're not just talking about the fairy godmothers in um, in the fairy tale and the French fairy tales, which is where they the, the classical fairy godmothers were kind of a late entry. So they were a consequence mostly of fairy tales by a guy called Charles Perrault, who was a French uh, writer of fairy tales. He did the classic Sleeping Beauty um, type of stories. I can't remember any others now, just out of spite. Uh, but he he introduced the figure of the fairy godmother, called the fairy godmother, into mainstream fairy tales. But again, if we look back, we can see clear examples of these mentor characters in the oldest stories. So earlier on, I mentioned in the Germanic tradition, Mother Holler, who is an old woman who lives at the bottom of a well spinning who is associated with an old sky goddess in the Germanic tradition. Mother Holler in the story that is normally told about her, which appears in the Grimm's fairy tales, for example, takes under her wing a young girl who effectively jumps into the well to recover a spindle that she has dropped. There we go, that spindle motif again. 
and she's frightened that her stepmother will shout at her if she comes home without the spindle and she is so frightened that she jumps into the well to get it back and after a few adventures in which she is nice to lots of things cows apple trees bread in oven um she comes across a house where there is this little old woman spinning and mother holler offers her an apprenticeship and the girl stays with mother holler for a year sometimes a year and a day these are all kind of like magical ideas and she does her housework and she learns various things from her and then she goes back and of course the gift from mother holler is a casket of gold now when her lazy stepsister comes down into the well looking for her casket of gold and is nasty to the cow nasty to the apple tree nasty to the bread that is burning in the oven and doesn't do any of the work that mother holler wants to she comes back with a casket of pitch and is basically killed when she opens it so we have again the sense of testing we have the sense of testing but also of apprenticeship so in some of the older stories you don't get the mentorship for nothing i suppose do you know um you have to in some way prove yourself and i am a great fan of the concept of apprenticeship because i think it has been lost from our culture in the sense that i don't know i do sometimes feel that many of us have a sense of entitlement and all of the old stories tell us you have to work really 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 hard you have to prove yourself before you get what you want before you get to be a writer you have to work for years and years and years honing your craft for example this apprenticeship idea that it doesn't all come um from a weekend workshop or something like that if you ever give my cynicism um so even in the the archetypical fairy godmothers as we might think of them or the typical rather fairy godmothers that come out of pedo and the sleeping beauty and um cinderella and so on are kind of waving their magic wands and it looks as if the the kids aren't working for it in the older stories they are working for it we have this concept of apprenticeship tied in with it but nevertheless it is mentoring the fairy godmothers want the best for the kids that they are mentoring and i think that that is something that we can all relate to and appreciate there is a sense in which the, the interesting story to me about fairy godmothers is the story of the sleeping beauty as told by perro so we have this um, princess who is born and while she's in her cradle there is a christening party and seven fairies are invited to be her godmothers and to give her gifts and if you remember there is one old fairy who is not invited actually in the old story by mistake because they haven't seen her for a long time and they think she's gone somewhere else anyway she's profoundly offended by this after the sixth fairy has given her gift in she flounces and puts a curse on the princess and it's left to the seventh fairy the seventh fairy godmother to do something about that curse now even though it's a fairy story the seventh fairy godmother can't undo the curse but she redeems again what seems like an irreparable situation she looks at the curse and she diverts it she takes some of the power out of it she transforms it into something that carries a grain of hope that carries the possibility of redemption so there's not instant death instead of the the princess dying when she pricks her finger on the spindle she simply falls into a sleep and there is a possibility with sleep not with death that she might be woken up so i like this idea also of older women as kind of embodying the power of the seventh fairy in a world that so often seems hopeless and although i'm normally quite a hopeful person every now and again particularly recently i look at the world and think oh my goodness this is just broken this is just broken but then i do because i'm just that mad i look at the story of the sleeping beauty and i think of the seventh fairy and i think well we're not powerless none of us can save the world none of us can take the curse away but i really do genuinely believe that every one of us has the power to transform what looks like a curse into something that carries a seed of hope 
with it. And so again, to me, that archetype, although when you say it, fairy godmother, it seems very twee, doesn't it? But when you delve into it and you delve more deeply into the stories, it actually it, it bears with it something that is very necessary today. And some of us as elders are the ones who carry that seed of hope to try to divert the curse that looks as if we are under. So that's kind of an important one. A more complicated archetype. It's actually a double archetype. I, I tend to think of them both together. The archetypes of trickster and truth teller. And particularly today, it's an area that is fraught with trouble. Truth being something that is I think possibly more complex now than it has been for a very, very, very long time. Trickster, in general, as an archetype, not just for women, but the trickster okay. archetype in general, has at its heart the quality of disruption. Not in every culture. In some cultures, trickster is just a joker, is, a, is an archetype that I would call the joker. You know, it's just kind of funny, a bit of a clown and what have you. But in, in European mythology, particularly, trickster is a disruptor. Trickster comes along when something in the culture badly needs to shift. And it isn't always pretty. Trickster is not supposed to be a pretty archetype. Years ago, when in the good old days before Brexit here in the UK, we were nevertheless looking at the possibility of a particularly appalling politician called Boris Johnson getting into power. And you over there had rather tragically elected Donald Trump. I wrote a blog post about trickster as cultural disruptor. And in it, I said that you don't always get the trickster you want, but you probably almost always get the trickster you deserve. And the reason for this, although that sounds awfully harsh, the reason for this is one of the things that Trickster does in disrupting is Trickster holds up a mirror to the culture and reflects back at the culture, the cultural shadow. Shadow in the Jungian sense, you know, so Jung believed that each of us has a shadow, which is not necessarily the negative, the bad, evil parts of our character, but the parts of our character that we can't come to terms with, for whatever reason, that we can't integrate, that we see, rightly or wrongly, as something that we need to avoid. And in all of the best stories about Trickster, that is exactly what Trickster does. So in, to me, in politicians like Johnson and Trump, they embody the worst qualities of the culture. They embody the things that culture risks becoming if something isn't turned around mighty fast. And often the very presence of a trickster that is so gloriously <laughs> encompassing the cultural shadow is enough to make everybody go, oh my God, that's terrible. We didn't realize we were like, Let, let's not be that anymore, if I can put it in very, very simplistic ways. So Although trickster isn't always pretty, trickster is very often necessary. One of the ways that trickster disrupts is not by embodying the cultural shadow, but trickster can disrupt by telling the truth. And so in a sense, this truth teller archetype, in my mind at least, is very highly associated with trickster because it's a disruptive archetype. In Hagitude, I do, I, the, the truth-telling chapter was probably the most difficult one um, that I had to write because I wanted to talk about the ways in which it has become impossible to have certain conversations that have multiple facets around issue, around certain issues. And the example 
that I decided to use was that of gender ideology. That was an easy one, right? And I used that example because I wanted to highlight the, the different ways in which truth telling can happen. So particularly on Twitter, which I do not participate in because it just breaks my heart every day, um, particularly on Twitter, there is a mode of cultural truth telling, which is about shouting and particularly about shouting down a mode in which my truth, which I believe firmly with all my heart, has to overcome your truth and there cannot be anything in the middle. And I used the example, and I don't know whether she is very well known in America, as she would be here. So back in the 70s, one of the first trans women was a woman, was someone called Jan Morris, who had spent her, her early life as a man in the military, you know, doing lots of things that would normally be considered to be masculine, had one of the first successful um, sex change operations. And because she then, well, she, she was a writer before that, but after that became a very, very well-known and much loved writer in the UK in days when nobody really was talking about such things and, you know, it just wasn't very visible. And I used Jan Morris as an example. She lived down the road here in Wales and I loved her very dearly mm -hmm. um, before I knew anything of her history after um, she wrote a wonderful book about Wales and Welsh culture and what it was to be Welsh. And my mother lived in this part of Wales for a very, very long time. But, but her way of truth telling was a much more embodied lived experience type of truth telling. So she never got involved in hmm, mudslinging, I want to say, in, in, in arguments, but she wrote a very wonderful book called Conundrum, which was about the process of going through that change and going through surgery. And it was such a beautiful way of illuminating new aspects of a struggle that all of us face, all of us, at at least one point during our life, which is that struggle for belonging in our own body, let alone to the wider world, and the search for meaning and authenticity. And she did it very beautifully. And I think made much more of a, an impact on the ways in which trans women were accepted in this culture than all of the mudslinging on Twitter. So I think first of all, when we're talking about the truth teller as an archetype, we have to really think very carefully about the most effective ways of doing truth. And I think, you know, we're at a point in our, in our culture here in the West where argument um, and an inability to see another person's perspective without being offended by it or finding it in some way diminishing of ourselves is a major, major part of the problems that we as a culture face. So if there are other ways of telling truth, of um, manifesting truth, if you like, then I think some of these older stories, as well as contemporary stories like those of Jan Morris, can help us understand that as we grow older and hopefully wiser, truth telling doesn't just mean blurting out stuff that you believe, no matter what the cost is to other people. Now, one of the finest truth tellers, to, so to go back, so that's just some context for what is a really important archetype, I think, but one which is incredibly difficult to do well without creating more of a mess than when you started. The, my favourite truth teller in myth and folktale is a character that perhaps some of you or most of you perhaps will have heard of, who is an old wild hag called Kundri, who appears in the old stories of the Grail, and particularly, uh, or specifically rather, the story of Percival, who is one of the knights who goes looking for the Grail. 
country appears in the in, in the only well-known German version of the Grail legends. You know, they were they were all over Europe at the time. There were multitudinous French versions. There was a German version. There was a Dutch version, um, which I've never quite come across. Or oh, it, it was just a big thing in medieval Europe. But a guy called Wolfram von Eschenbach wrote um, a long text called Percival, and in the story, to cut a very long story short, Parseval is kind of like the fool in the tarot. Um, he's hidden away by his mother in the woods. He doesn't know anything about culture. She wants to keep him safe because his father has died in battle and she doesn't want him to be a knight. So she doesn't want him to know anything about the possibility. But inevitably, one day he's in the woods and he sees these great knights in shining armor come riding along. And of course, he wants to be them. So off he goes on his adventures. Very long story. Very, very wonderful story. He ends up at King Arthur's court having, you know, um, fought various other knights in battle and stolen their armor and all kinds of malarkeys of the kind that go on in, in such adventures. And then he's very pleased with himself because he's a knight at King Arthur's court. And one day he happens across something that turns out to be the Grail Castle. And he goes inside and he sees all kinds of wondrous things there. He sees a king lying down, clearly uh, mortally wounded because of a, um, a wound in his groin. Um, he sees while they're eating dinner a, a magical procession of otherworldly women bearing something that turns out to be the grail and there's a guy with a bleeding lance and all of the rest of it. Percival, because he has been told by his mother not to ask too many questions, doesn't say a thing to all this. He doesn't ask the king why he's, why he's wounded. He doesn't ask who these people are <laughs> walking through the hall while they're having dinner. He doesn't ask what the grail is. He doesn't do anything. He just eats his tea and he goes to bed. And then he wakes up the next morning and lo and behold, the Grail Castle has vanished. He failed. He found the Grail and he failed. But Parseval being Parseval doesn't think he's failed at all because he's a fine knight at King Arthur's court. So he goes back to King Arthur's court. He's sitting there surrounded by all of his fine knightly friends. And all of a sudden, out of the forest rides this character who is described in all kinds of wonderful terms that I can never remember, but she has kind of eyebrows that are kind of like hanging down to her chin. She has tusks. Um, she, she, she is the archetypical loathly lady. That's a folklore motif. A loathly lady is a hag. And she comes and she lays into Percival and she tells him all of the ways in no uncertain terms in which she has failed. There he is, having his dinner, drinking a glass of wine with all these fine people, um, you know, very pleased with themselves while the Fisher King is wounded in the Grail Castle. The land is a wasteland as a consequence, and they're just all sitting around feeling pleased with themselves. So she really does lay into Percival, and he's quite, well, by the time she's gone, he is absolutely devastated by this. He goes on some journey, to cut a very long story short, he goes off on some journey of self-discovery. He finds the Grail Castle again and asks the question, the question that must be asked of the Fisher King, what ails thee? He shows compassion. He doesn't just let it happen. And as a consequence of that, the land is no longer a wasteland and Percival has become the new Fisher King. So at that point, Kundry rides, you know, Kundry um, finds Percival again and tells him what a wonderful job he's done. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't hold a grudge. She recognizes that he's grown. She recognizes that things have changed and she comes out and she praises him. So this one, and it's very beautiful in the actual text, the things that she says to him. She's, you know, she's talking about how she's, he's very beautiful and she's very ugly, but her heart is more beautiful than his because it's honest and authentic and full of compassion. And he basically doesn't give a damn. So Kundry is quite different from the example that I used of Jan Morris. You know, she is someone who comes out and in no uncertain terms tells Percival where he's gone wrong. But she does it for a purpose. She doesn't do it out of anger. She does it because she wants him to become the new Fisher King. She wants him to find the Grail. She wants to challenge him so that he goes away and thinks again and embarks on a journey of self-discovery. And again, that sense of, okay, so she's a pretty much in your face kind of truth teller, but she doesn't do it vicariously. She doesn't do it for her voice to be heard. She does it because this has to be said in order for Percival to grow and to change and to fulfill his destiny. So let's have a, what do you all think about that? The easy one. Let's discuss the easy one, truth telling. How do you think we can 
encourage the kind of culture in which truths can be told and conversations that are difficult can be held without shouting and talking over each other. That's an easy one at this time of the day. Linda. Uh, you're muted, Linda. You're muted, Linda. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I'm a grandmother and I, my biggest uh, lament is that people don't listen to children. If they really listened and even maybe thought about it, and even maybe, you know, tried to find out more about what the youngster is thinking, we would have a much different kind of person growing up. That's sort of. Yeah, I think you're quite right. Yeah. Anybody else? Or shall I just, Karen, you're muted too, Karen. Um, th this is my father's wisdom. He was a diplomat and he was saying the first thing you do is you look for what you have in common with the person. You're establishing that you see their humanity, you're looking for rapport. And then as um, Linda just said, really listen and listen with the idea of trying to understand rather than listening with the idea of what am I going to say next in response right. is easier to say than do <laughs> <laughs> and Christy so uh one of the things that I learned that guide me is that I am responsible for how someone else perceives me when we're communicating and so um, that means I need a fairly deep toolbox in terms of listening and being aware of how I'm perceived to engage in conversations with people that are uh, that maybe don't hold the same views that I do or something like that. And then sort of as a subtext below that, I always try to check myself in if I get hooked into a conversation where I've lost sight of being responsible for how somebody perceives me or I'm starting to behave in a way or take a hook that I don't want to do. Am I behaving in a way in my speaking and listening that's about power over or power with? And I didn't invent that phrase, by the way, at least in my community, I learned it in nonviolent communication. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Next one up is the wise woman, which in mostly in the European tradition is, is about deep vision. So in Ireland, we have this character called the Ban Fasser. I'm going to type that in because it's in case any of you want to follow it up. The Ban Fasser. And that means literally in Irish the woman of knowledge and she would have been in most of the stories a midlife or older woman the best known example she probably lived but she might have been legend is a woman called biddy early who was said to be a wise woman in county clare and the band Fasser was very interesting because the wise woman in certainly in the celtic tradition and probably in the wider European tradition, is not a herbalist in the same way that often, you know, a wise woman would be conflated with, with herbalism in, in some parts of the world today. So she might use herbs, but the herbs weren't the point. In Scotland, there was something similar, um, wasn't called a band facet, depends where you are, what, what she was called, so I won't go there. Herbs, herbs were never used alone. Herbs were used 
and they only had power if the wise woman did some ritual stuff associated with them. So, for example, you would, you would give herbs to someone and you would say a charm at the same time. You would tell the herb how wonderful it was and how much you really appreciated its power and its beauty when it flowered and all of the rest of it. And you would basically praise it in order to cajole it to help the person. It's no good just plonking a herb in somebody in this tradition. That was disrespectful. What you, or, or and sometimes and, there would be um, other rituals. So you would, you would take a thread and you would knot it at the same time as you were saying a charm, as you were kind of making a kind of incantation. And that would add power to it, to the herb and to the incantation. So the physical herb was never enough. You had to do this other stuff as well. And the reason why you had to do this other stuff was that you were then bringing in to the situation the power of the other world rather than just relying on the physical world. And so the Banfasa and the wise woman in the Celtic tradition was someone whose main job actually was to be a kind of liaison between the community and the other world. And herbs and stuff were kind of, well, not by the by, clearly there is a power in the plant, but but they were tools that the heart of it was the interaction with the other world. And so the wise woman in the Celtic tradition is an intermediary between the community and the other world, or the fairies in later tradition, as the inhabitants of the other world would have been called later. And so, for example, if... And, and the wise woman wasn't just about healing. She was about anything to do with the other world. So if someone had lost a cow, she would go to the fairies and ask them where the cow was and then come back and tell the person. And there have been, there's been some speculation that this was done in a kind of shamanic style trance, but there isn't anything actually in the stories that makes you believe anything other than that. They went to some place where they believed the veil between this world and the other world was thin and they spoke to the fairies. That's what they were doing. Biddy Early, the woman I mentioned, who's probably Ireland's most famous wise woman, had a tool. She had a blue bottle that was given to her, she said, by the fairies. And when she looked into the blue bottle, she could see into the other world. And she could partake of its wisdom and learn things from it. There is a sense in which the wise woman, so you have this sense of deep vision, you know, of being able to see into the other world, of being able to see beyond the physical, of being able to see beyond the veil. But there's a sense in which, in a way, they were also kind of community psychologists, because if anything had gone wrong in the community, if there was a dispute, if there were fears of witchcraft or, you know, whatever it might be, they would be the ones who would sort it out by going to consult the fairies. And they would come back with their solution, whatever it was, and they would make changes in the community to accommodate it. So the wise woman rather than being, you know, simply a physical healer or um, a herbalist kind of person, was very much possessed of these qualities that you might see in a kind of community psychologist. There are other examples of that sense of deep vision. If we look at oracles and prophetesses, for example, we find that they are often also associated with older women. So the Pythia in Greece, who was the head oracle at Delphi in the um, Temple of Apollo, the Pythia was not allowed to be the Pythia until she was 50, at least. You had to be over 50 to be the Pythia. And there are many examples in other cultures around the world, which I don't know so much about, where this is the case. So a friend told me who 
was raised in the um, the um, the Sun people tradition, the, what we used to call the Bushmen of South Africa, that older women, particularly older women who had not had children, were said to have special powers, a special kind of insight, a special ability to liaise with the other world. So we see this again around the world in various different traditions in various stories what does that mean well not necessarily that we all have to be prophets or to have blue bottles to look into the other world but again i think it is this this kind of recurring theme that we're seeing in different iterations of older women having the big picture being able to see what is stepping back in a sense and seeing what is going wrong in a culture and kind of having the spiritual authority to step in. So in, you often find stories, particularly in Ireland, where the wise woman is in con conflict with the priest. Everybody was, well, women were always in conflict with priests in Irish folklore. But um, the reason for that is, in a sense, they were occupying the same territory. They were trying to occupy the same territory as kind of being the moral voice for a community in some way representing the conscience of the community of being the conduit between the community and the other world where one was needed so that's another really powerful archetype then we have and this is a more difficult one for me to see how this quite relates to modern culture so I'd be interested in your thoughts we have the dangerous old woman the one who tests the hero or heroine to the point of death and the typical example here is Baba Yaga from the Slavic tradition so for those of you who might not know Baba Yaga, she is an old woman who lives deep in the heart of the forest in a house on chicken legs, which is surrounded by a fence made of bones with skulls on top that act as lanterns with little candles in. And Baba Yaga flies through the air in a mortar carrying a pestle like a kind of row. So those things that you grind spices up with. And she uh, clearly she is it is known that she is an old um, goddess uh, figure who has transformed in folklore to, well, you know, again, she's often presented as an evil witch, but she absolutely is not. She is a typical example of what I said at the beginning about the ambiguity, neither good nor evil, but just what is necessary. I come back to this concept of necessity again. When you encounter Baba Yaga, you don't know you're going to be tested and you don't know whether you're going to live or die. Because if you fail her tests, she has a man-sized oven in her kitchen and she will bake you and eat you. So the consequences are high here, you know. She can see behind the mask and beyond the veil. You can't hide your true self from her. You can't hide what is happening. If you have help to pass her test, she knows about it. So again, the classic story that's associated with Baba Yaga that most people would know is the story of Vasilisa, who is sent to Baba Yaga looking for fire because the fires have gone out at home. Her wicked stepmother and stepdaughters send her into the woods to get fire. Otherwise, they'll not be able to eat and they'll be very cold so she arrives at Baba Yaga's house and to cut a long story short she is tested and she passes the tests and she leaves carrying the fire unlike some who would fail and be eaten. So Baba Yaga is an initiator character. She is she initiates the children. She tests them to the utmost and it's not an easy process, as in all the best initiations, you run the risk of dying. Otherwise, they're not proper initiations. Um, and she is requiring you to go beyond what you think are your limitations, to ask 
questions that might be perceived to be dangerous. And Vasilisa does ask a couple of questions that are dangerous, but she stops at the one that she knows will absolutely make everything go pear-shaped. And also to step outside, you know, the usual world of, of logic and reason. This sense of testing to the very extremes is perhaps why I find it hard to imagine a Baba Yaga type character in everyday life. I don't know that we can necessarily become Baba Yaga, but nevertheless, this idea that in, in a powerful old age, we can inspire people to discover and to value the truth about themselves, to understand their limitations, to, to grow, to become you know, the best that they can be. Perhaps that is the kind of, I want to say, um, smaller, but I don't mean smaller. Perhaps that's, you know, the Baba Yaga for the contemporary world as opposed to the big Baba Yaga goddess. And the tests that she is setting in those stories come at, you know, for, for Vasilisa and the others at critical choice points really in their lives inspiring them to be brave and and to learn how best to fulfill their potential in a world that really doesn't want them necessarily to succeed that wants to render them kind of innocuous and overly careful she inspires people to take risks because you have to take risks because if you don't you're almost certainly going to die so she kind of she's the elder who sort of tests our metal and pushes us to become challenges pushes out of our comfort zone and, and challenges us to become the best that we can be so what what does that conjure up in you in terms of contemporary iterations of that archetype people characters in books that you might think of ideas margaret I, I'm just imagining that right now we're all in a sense facing kind of Baba Yaga, Baba Yagi energies. I mean, I think we're all being pushed out of our comfort zone. We're watching the web of life unravel. I mean, we're watching, there's so much undoing and dismantling. So I, I'm just imagining what if sort of all of it is, is like her and it's challenging us to really manifest all the qualities you're just saying, test our metal, rise to the occasion, become our true selves, manifest who we really want to be in the world. So I don't, I don't imagine any of us embodying her in particular, but I'm just imagining a reframe of this is actually how life is presenting itself to us right now. Yeah, so I, I was I was thinking of a kind <clears throat> not I don't mean precisely in the way that you've said, but very much as she is the elder who tests us so that we become elders in turn you know, rather than as necessarily exactly embodying her. So, yes, I think I can see that as a possibility. Catherine. Um, yeah, just to ride on with what you guys were just saying. Um, yeah, I definitely hear what you're saying about that's her role is to test us and inspire and challenge. But I did find myself thinking about what kind of person must she be to be willing to be able to be able to do that and so i was thinking you know just a person who's willing to live her own truth to to see the hard truths first you know just really even though we're not talking about embodying her qualities i still find myself thinking wow to be able to be that kind of force of nature what must one find and be willing to face within oneself first to be able to do that, um, to have such courage and see the truth so clearly? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Thank you, yeah. Okay. Um, the next one, isn't really a character out of a story. So before I get to that, all of these, as, as I said at the, at, in the first half, with the exception of the henwife and 
maybe one or two others. None of these women are defined by anything other than themselves. Would you agree with that? They're not somebody's mother, somebody's grandmother, somebody's wife. They are just, you want to say forces of nature, but I suppose that's a terrible cliche, although in the case of the Kalyuk, it is actually literally true. Um, they just are. And I think that in itself tells us a lot about what we need to know about becoming elder. And I do not mean that we stop valuing our relationships. I mean simply that it is a time of life in the old stories when these women really are focused on who they are in the world, who they are in the world, and what the nature of their wisdom is. And it was really instructive for me to go to those stories and say, okay, what, what, what is this character actually about? What precisely is she offering? And as you can see, there are, there's quite a range. In spite of the fact that if you say to somebody, you know, name a powerful elder woman in, in myths and fairy tales, they almost always say, I don't know, I don't know, I can't think of one. You know, they can think of the princesses. But it's harder to think of a powerful old woman, but they all are, and they are holy themselves. The final archetype relates to another conversation, a bit like menopause, that we can't seem to have properly in our culture, and that's death. So the end of this journey through the second half of life is, by design, death. And I didn't find very many archetypes of death in the stories. Death happened. You know, you could argue that Baba Yaga was, in a sense, because that's what would happen to you if you failed her tests. But to find old women who in some way embody death was tricky until I came across a reference, it's a long story, so I won't bore you with it, but I came across a reference in a book to an old Samoyed story that intrigued me. And I followed this up for years and finally found it in a German version, which had been translated from the Swedish, which had been translated from the Samoyed. And I gave it to a German friend and she translated the story for me. And it's a long saga, as many of these things are, kind of a hero tale. But in it, a young hero, through various misadventures, dies three times or is killed three times. And in each of each of the times, a one-legged, one-armed, one-eyed old man brings him back to life. Now, if you know anything about shamanic culture, this, this one-sidedness is the clear sign of a, you know, an otherworldly shamanic type figure. But that's not what I'm interested in. When it happens for a fourth time, the old man says, well, I can't do anymore. I've already given you my three times. So he waits until the bones of the hero have been cleaned by foxes and ravens and all of the other things that clean flesh from bones. He gathers the bones up in a sack, throws the sack over his shoulder and goes walking until he comes to a hole in the ground. And he goes underground and finds himself in this cave-like environment, which is peopled by effectively skeletons, bone creatures. And then in the middle of the, the this vast cavernous place is a tent. And he goes inside the big tent and he goes inside the tent and there is an old woman sitting um, by an unlit fire with two monsters guarding her, bone monsters effectively. And he says to the old woman, look, I brought you some firewood. And he pours the bones out and she said oh it's a good thing because I'd run out of firewood and then she sets light to the bones and they burn down to ashes and she takes the ashes of the bones and puts them in her bed and she sleeps on the bones and it, within three days the young man has come back to life so we have this really interesting character and I'm sure there are more like that I've heard hints of, of stories particularly in that Siberian tradition where we have the old woman not just as a, an archetype of death, but as an archetype of rebirth. And of course, the one clearly goes before the other. And 
we do see death rebirth figures scattered throughout mythology but this was a particularly beautiful story and because i couldn't think of a, an archetype i called her old bone mother um and that sense of bringing life out of dead things allowing what must die to die but bringing life out of it new life out of it i think is another quality that we can look at and learn from again it's all part i think all of these archetypes at some level are iterations of a creative energy as we were saying earlier but this is very much and we, we've got bits of the alchemist in it because it's transforming but i like those stories particularly because perhaps they help us find a way into a conversation that again culturally we can't seem to have and it, at the end of the book I was spending some time because uh, what would it be about 18 months ago I was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of lymphoma and so went through my own kind of walk through the valley of the shadow of death for a while with chemotherapy and all of that malarkey and um it clearly it became very important to me to think about these conversations that we're not having and to think about what that archetype means in our lives and it seems to me for various reasons and i we don't have time to have a huge long conversation about this but that meeting with death and particularly in the form if you look at it in the form of this particular old woman really informs us about how to live that we can't necessarily see life except in the context of death it's that whole thing about opposites except they're not really opposites but i think you probably know what i mean that we have that we can't see the light except in the context of understanding what darkness is and you know similar examples that if as a culture and if as individuals we haven't in some way learned to I want to say befriend death because I do think of it as that for reasons I don't have time to explain to you. But if we don't find a way of um, embracing the archetype, that's not really what I mean. But if we don't find a way of being able to see death as a necessary, sometimes even perhaps positive force, then I think we will always probably be sick as a culture and particularly we'll be sick as individuals who are hurtling headlong towards that inevitable end of the journey. So one of the things that I am aiming to do in um, the future months is to look for, you know, more stories of that are positive with death type of characters in them, death rebirth type of characters in them to again find a way of collecting those stories together so that they enhance that particular kind of conversation i because i see the world in this way by nature of my training as well as my inclination and the fact that i'm a writer i tend to personify everything you know if there is an energy i tend to personify it so it helped me i think to see death as old bone mother to imagine an old woman picking up the bones it's a little bit like Clarissa Pinkler Estes story of a uh, woman who ran with the wolves and La Loba and the woman that um, sings over the bones it's a similar kind of thing but slightly different probably um and yet a lot of people that I've spoken to can't see death as anything other than an energy you know can't kind of see it as a character it doesn't really matter there's no right or wrong way of doing it but I'm interested in whether any of you have a concept of a death rebirth kind of figure in this way that's personified. I think I, I can let me see. Sorry, who is that? I can't see. That is Rachel. Let me Rachel, come. okay. Yeah. Oh, hello. Okay. <laughs> um, well, when you were speaking there, I just I thought about St. Francis because he writes about sister death. Mm. He talks about our sister, you know, he talks about um sleep and then sister the sister of sleep is death sister death which is quite a i think quite a nice image really personification of death mm. sister. that's lovely yes i'd forgotten that I, yes that's yeah, i think it's the canticle of the sun right the canticle, the canticle of the sun you know the sun oh, in the sky right. yeah. 
song. Yeah. We kind of love the song, and I think he writes about her as the now sister. Mm, yeah, yeah, that that's a good sound. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm struck by uh, at the beginning today you talking into archetypes to make that clear and you used beauty and and not a personification and a lot of these it feels like there is a reclaiming or at least a shifting happening and we're at different places so when I brought up the crone I don't mean that I that I think Americans have fully embraced crone, obviously not. But there's a spectrum where I can see movement on it. And then when you get to Baba Yaga, who is a particular favorite of mine, and to death, I think that they're a little bit less, um, we're, we're not able to personify them with, as, as easily um, because of our separation from death being such a big thing. So when you were talking about Baba Yaga, I was thinking about the characteristics there being like, those are like the great trials, like having a health crisis like yours, like many people, have had where those are matters of consequence and um baba yaga there there's all of this evidence that there's been plenty of um, fuel for bone woman's fire all around and yet vasilisa is treated more a little bit parallel to Parsifal in other stories by other characters. And so there's like, to me, a couple of sides of Baba Yaga. And then with death, I think we, we're so separated from it being incorporated as the value part in the over cultures we've been raised in that it's just harder for us to see it as a personification. Yeah, I think you're quite right. And I think that's why the more stories, the merrier, because if we can see literally the different faces of death, uh, then we begin to have more of a concept of it. We begin in our own lives and we begin to be able to have more of a concept of it in the culture so that it's not necessarily seen. You know, the only the only archetype of death we have in this culture is the Grim Reaper, you know, which I mean, those of you who know Terry Pratchett as a writer in the UK will know that he he had a wonderful iteration of, of that character called death who looked like the grim reaper in all of his books spoke in capital letters and was you know rather funny actually and a lot of people you know found it did, did actually in real life find that easier to think about death particularly when it was facing them by just laughing at terry pratchett's character called death so in all kinds of different ways i think stories help ease the way even if we're not actively ourselves embodying we're not going to embody death but the stories teach us how to um how to embody aspects of the experience in a way that's useful for the culture perhaps karen uh, yes i'm thinking of kali in the hindu tradition are you familiar with her yeah 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 and I, I heard once a wonderful story about Kali, and I don't know whether it was an authentic Indian story or one that somebody um, from the West had, had made up, but it was a lovely story about Kali and time and how she was asleep and she woke up and there were all of these people outside of her window and they were crowded and crowded and they were all hungry and they were all kind of on top of each other. And anyway, to cut a long story short, she, you know, gets in her chariot time and puts on her with her coachman death and what have you and basically deals out death so that the land can replenish itself and there's room for everyone to to eat so you know there, there, there are all kinds of stories at every kind of level I think that can perhaps help us through this but it would be a very very fine thing if we started to um to find them and perhaps to talk about them and to use them okay well, 
let's have another breakout before we and, and then a final discussion before we finish so what i'm interested in, in this breakout is kind of a little bit like what you did at the beginning but to look at which of these archetypal expressions of female elderhood you most resonated with were there any that you found particularly difficult to imagine so it's kind of a, a house of elders with many different rooms and um which one of them do you feel called to occupy which one of them perhaps do you think might reflect your own personal inner hag. So we'll take 20 minutes again for you. Ready? Okay, brilliant. Thank you. I'll be back in one minute. Okay. All back. Great. Okay. So shall we have some feedback again from what you talked about in the groups? Who would like to volunteer something? Anything that you shared that seems pertinent would be lovely. Wendelin. I think Betsy was waving. Betsy, was that true? Well, I was, but I can't figure out how oh, to raise, right. raise my hand on my, I'm not seeing a raise hand option. So I was waving. Re but, reactions. <laughs> That's fine. I, I read the wrong name out, but do go ahead. That's okay. Um, oh, it was so rich. I, I think that one of the things that I'd like to share from our group was that we all felt threads of resonance with all of these different archetypes um you know the threads interweave and we were also talking about how we feel the connection of the threads between all of us this afternoon uh today being together and what we're creating here and the safe space that you're creating for us Sharon to share um and also something that came up which I think spoke to all of us deeply was finding a way to balance the work with the grief that we're feeling about the state of everything <laughs> and how to keep going in the face of that. Mm. Um, and these came up. Yeah. And um, that's what I wanted to share about our group. I'm sure there was much more, but uh, I'm just feeling super grateful for the opportunity to have these conversations today. So thank you. Thank you too. <clears throat> I'm just going to share my own perspective on that briefly, because certainly in the last 18 months, it's um, it's come up for me. And it comes up in the context of something that is actually very close to what I think of as the meaning of elderhood. So if you are looking at the second half of life as, uh, you know, as a kind of spiritual journey, a journey to find meaning, for me, that is always tied up in the old um, Platonic ancient Greek concept, which we now call calling, which is not about vocational profession, but is, is the idea that every soul in Plato's vision uh, comes into this world called with a particular gift, uh, a particular thing to do or to be, not necessarily grandiose, but just some unique way of representing the gift of life in the universe. That's what it's about. It's not about what you do. It's about your unique expression of life, of what it is to be human. That's calling. And I've always 
I haven't always, I have over the past five years, I would say, come to believe that when you know that you are doing that or when you feel that you are doing that, that, that your work in the world is about embodying your calling, that you're giving your gift in, in the only way that you can give your gift, at some level, you lose attachment to outcome. And I don't mean you don't care. I do not absolutely mean you don't care. I just mean that if you are in the knowledge that you are being what you can be, that you are doing what you perhaps came here to do, that you are that you are displaying that unique way of representing life, then it becomes a lot easier to carry on. Not easy in a cowardly, cowardly kind of way, but just to kind of like, well, I can't save the world. <laughs> I wasn't brought here to save the world. I was brought here to be what I can be with all of the gifts that that entails. And again, I, I have found it very much easier to say, okay, I can't solve this. I can't. And that doesn't mean that I don't feel grief quite regularly. But there's a purpose to me being here that I don't understand and never will. Therefore, I have to lose attachment to outcome because I haven't a clue what the outcome might be. I used to agonize about, you know, how many people must I save? How many people must I reach? And it's just like, well, how do you know what matters? It's not about numbers. Maybe there's just one in the corner there somewhere that you never even noticed. And I just began to realize that I can't do anything about that. I can't inform myself about that. I can only just do my work in the world. And I think it is a really, really important question. And I don't think we ever solve the grief, but I think the answer to it, and this is just purely from my perspective, I'm not preaching to any of you. From my perspective, the answer is just to do your work and just live, you know. But thank you for, for raising that. It's an important point. Anybody else want to share something? Yes, I can't see whose hand it is. Catherine. Wow. Oh my God. I just love that. I was taking notes as you were writing. That is so perfect for me. It speaks to me. Um, and then something else I'll share from our group that um, sort of addresses that hopelessness was, or the grief was um, the idea of trickster as disruptor and that being sowing seeds of hope. And the woman who shared that can speak to that if I'm not getting this right, but it's almost like it's a disruptive cause to, to actually sow seeds of hope. So yeah. anyway, yeah. I love that. Yeah, indeed. Karen, you're muted. Yeah, uh, I've got a question for you, Sharon, and that is, um, can you tell us about uh, Crohn's ceremonies? Can you put anything in the follow-up materials or speak to that now? I can't, actually, because it's not such a common thing here. I think that is something that you've begun more in North America. It's not that there aren't some. Um, but it's not a it's not really a common thing. And again, it is something one of the things that I'm interested in developing over the course of this next year with with the program that we're running is is to look at how at not so much ceremonies, but how we mark the deeper kind of initiation experience that comes at menopause and that actually I do think comes later as well. I don't think menopause is the end of the initiations, unfortunately, in case any of you were hoping it might be. No, there's more to come, more fun and games to come. How do we mark them and how do we, I'm interested specifically in, in how we revision the vision quest for mm -hmm. elder women who might not be able to go out particularly and sit in the desert starving themselves and <laughs> not drinking for four days and nights, which is very fine at certain times of your life. But I, I wonder if that's not a very heroic model of the vision quest. How do we reinvent that? So that whole idea of rituals and rites of passage, possibly more than ceremonies, really interests me. I don't have the answer yet, but I'm working with someone uh, as part of this program who's done some work with um, Bill Plotkin's Animus Valley Institute 
to think very deeply about how we make this process also a little bit more feminine in intent. I don't mean feminine in the sense of womanly, but again, that feminine principle, how we make it a little still powerful, still going very, very deep, but maybe not quite so focused on the all that physical. So it, it's something that's, I don't have an answer for you, but it, it's something that I'm certainly focused on. I'm excited to hear that you're working with Bill Plotkin because I did do something with him many, many decades ago. So that's cool. Yeah, it, it's not Bill himself, but it's someone who, who works very closely uh, cool. with him. Um, but yeah. Linda. You're muted again. I want to thank you um, as well. Sharon, one of the things that to me was a surprise is, is that there is so little written about this stage and so little written uh, by people in our stage about this time. And I talked with this uh, to my group. I have found this particularly so about the grandmother life. When my uh, grandson was born, I went to look for books written by grandmothers about grandmothering in this time, and I found nothing. Hmm. So I do believe we should fill this gap, and I invite anyone, whatever you're doing, as you have, and you have laid it out Sharon, in a beautiful way, we can all, you know, fit in, I think, our stories with this context that you've given us to work with our different, um, whatever it is that we are doing, that we are making an effort to share and to contribute, you know, to life now. Indeed. And, and to me, that whole concept of what it is to be a grandmother is something that I you know clearly I don't have children so I don't feel particularly um that, that I have uh, the the knowledge or the right to speak about but I, I see it as part of the kind of a, a different aspect of the mentoring archetype from the fairy godmother you know it's a it's a it's a it's a different thing you see you do see grandmothers in fairy tales you don't actually see very many of them but you do see them. You see, you know, the Red Riding Hood grandmother is kind of interesting, except she is bedridden. But I bet there's a story behind that grandmother. Yeah. Actually, I'd quite like to write that. That's for my next book yeah. of short stories. <laughs> I'll yeah. steal that idea now. Um, so, yes, that is, that is something for sure that I think we need to we need to work on as well. Yeah. Thank you. OK, who's waving? Kirsten, is it? I, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, as we were going in our group, going through the different archetypes and I was resonating more strongly with one, but, you know, as I was listening to the other women in my group, I realized that some of those other ways I could express, I could still express some of those other archetypes in ways that's not uh, like typical I, or not typical, but just in my own way. I suppose, like for example, truth telling, I'm like, no, I definitely, that doesn't ring true for me, but that doesn't feel like I'm, you know, that would be my. Nope, oh, I think we've lost you, Kirsten. Oh, we sorry. froze on us for a while. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, for example, the truth telling archetype, I could do that through writing as opposed to. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, all of these archetypes have different ways of embodying that experience, you know, depending on, as I said earlier, on our own individual skills and gifts and um, and what we bring to it. So I don't think there's any one right way of doing any of these archetypes. It's they're all there as inspiration for our imagination. Yeah. Thank you. One last one, Susan. If you'd like to unmute. Working on it. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. This is a quick Karen. Um, the only I ever experienced in Scotland 
Susan, I'm so sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, I think you've got a distortion on your line. Um, and Susan, I, I suggest that you turn your video off and then your bandwidth will increase so you can talk. Uh, how do I do that? Video um, off. <laughs> oh, yeah. I said stop it, video. Yep, there you go, that, try it now. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, is that better? So the only croning I ever experienced was in Findhorn in Scotland. And it was a cloak that was hand woven and it was white. And on the inside, uh, the women who were being croned, everyone put a picture, a memento, a something inside this cloak. So then it was opened up. You could see all the women who had been croned previously. And I, I don't know if it's, it was only that one time that I experienced that. And I don't know what happened to the cloak. I don't know what happened to the, to the um, experience with anyone else. But to me, it was um, a connection. And yeah. it was uh, um, something that I thought about maybe carrying here, but I haven't done it yet. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm sure there are there, there are lots of beautiful ceremonies that people have uh, have invented over the the past few years. Uh, that sounds particularly lovely. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for participating. I think we have come to the end of the road today. And uh, before I hand over to Fia to say goodbyes and everything, just to let you know that the the website that I mentioned has some of these stories. So in Hagitude. Um, I don't I don't put all of the stories and that I've spoken about in full in the book. I refer to the archetypes and and you know there are summaries of the stories, but the stories, the texts of the stories are being put in full on the Hagitude website at hagitude.org. And there is also um some podcast episodes there where I'm talking just to people, random women, not necessarily the biggest names, because sometimes that's funner, more fun, but just random women about the experience of elderhood and how they went through it and what they found challenging and inspiring so you can listen to all of that and read all of that for free at the website so thank you so much for participating and Fia thank you for hosting so beautifully for us oh you're welcome and thank you for doing this and thank everybody for coming it's been a lovely few hours <laughs>